In front of the girl sat Kalen Devilton. He was the one who has all the wealth of the kingdom and great power and offered to become his daughter. This is the protagonist of Prince Devilton's days, and she is just a minor character, a homeless girl who doesn't even know when she will die in this story. And becoming his daughter is like winning the lottery. It sounded so sweet like a dream, but she has one thing on her mind. The hero of the story was a homicidal maniac. The girl was happy because today she was able to calculate two words from the newspaper. The boy sitting next to her did not understand why she did it, because she could not even read. She boasted that she even knew some letters, but she did it because she didn't want to continue being homeless. And to change her fate, she had to get out of those back alleys and get a job. She didn't understand how she survived after her mother's death. Her friends thought she looked nice, and that's why passers-by often gave her money. They began to look for those who looked richer and tell her, if she managed to beg for something, they ate bread with them. Now the boy pointed her into the crowd, saying that one of the men looked very wealthy and solid, and it was a task just for her. When she approached him, she had no idea that it would change her whole life. For at first, she asked for a coin, but the man turned away from her saying he was busy. The guy's name was Kalen, and he wondered where the man had gone, if he hadn't caught up with him, and he had already run away. Looking for him in the crowd, he realized that if he was late, the criminal could catch a train. The culprit was the guy in the red beret, but Cullen didn't know it. He had already changed his outfit and put on a red cap and mingled with the crowd of poor people. Kalen ran towards the train station, but the criminal had already started the massacre. The blood of more than 30 victims spurted onto the ground, the first being a boy named Walter. The girl realized that she heard the words just like in the book and looked at the boy and realized that Walter was in danger. So she rushed to the man, grabbed his cloak and told him that he couldn't go to the station or people would die. She began to explain that there was a strange man in a red beret nearby and she saw him pretend to be heading toward the station while he hid in an alley. He looks just like the devil killer William on the wanted posters. After listening to the girl, Kaylin immediately rushed into the alley and managed to catch the criminal. Using dark magic, he disarmed him and killed him with all the cruelty. The girl couldn't stand it and realized that she had to run away before he came back. But not before Kaylin stopped her to ask her a few questions. He handed her a business card and told her that there were too many eyes and ears to talk to. He introduced himself and asked her to find him because he needed to talk to her about how she had helped him. And then he vanished into thin air. In the evening, lying on earth, she realized that she was living inside the story as a secondary character, who was also a homeless woman and did not understand whether she would end her days on the street. She was upset because she had not even had time to taste all the joys of life and remembered the words of her parents, who said that in the next life, she should be born a healthy and happy girl. When she woke up in the morning, she took the newspaper and looked at the familiar letters, which appeared to be the same set of words as on the business card. With some difficulty, she was able to read it and learned that Prince Levelton was recruiting maids, and she supposed that perhaps it was a chance to change her fate, especially since Kaylin had told her to go there. A short time later, she was standing at the gate of the prince's estate, explaining to the guard that the man had handed her the card and told her to come there. A carriage stopped nearby, and two boys got out of it. When they heard the guard's explanation, they assumed that their father had a new hobby. One of the boys agreed to take the girl inside, and when she got to her father, he asked her if he really knew her. She had his card and claimed that Kaylin had given it to her. She approached the man, explaining that she had seen an ad in the paper that they needed maids, and since she had helped him that time, he could help her now. She told him that she was nine years old, but she was very strong and healthy and could eat only once a day, and she was actually good at everything, washed the floors well, and did all the chores. She said all this in one breath and added that since she was small, she could clean the chimney without any problems. A girl named Maria, who was Cullen's sister, came into the office, and when asked where her parents were, she said that her mom had died a couple years ago and she didn't have a home. She said that she slept on the street but was not sick because she slept on clean roads and also collected discarded blankets and covered herself with them. Maria heard that Kaylin wanted to thank her for that and called her and she did not understand why she wanted to become a servant, because she could have gotten something more and more important. The girl explained that she wanted to be something else, 
And when she grew up, she didn't want to be a beggar so that no one would swear at her or call her names. She just wanted to be ordinary like others. After listening to the girl's story, Maria patted her on the head, saying that she was very smart. And noticing the flowers in her hands, she realized that the girl had brought them as a gift. She did not know how to explain where she got the flowers from, but she was afraid that they would not think that she had stolen them. So she said that when she woke up, they were already there. She also had a friend who sold flowers, and sometimes he gave her what was left, and probably the guys put them near her while she was asleep. When Maria asked her how much she would like to be paid, the girl said that she would accept exactly as much as they would give her. For example, a quarter of an adult salary. Kaylin looked at her carefully and said that he needed to check something first and asked her how she knew that he was following William. The girl had prepared her answer in advance and said that she had just seen a man who looked just like the one on the wanted ad in the alley. When asked why she decided to help him, the girl explained that it was just an accident because she just wanted to help someone and then she saw him. She noticed him because he was handsome, but she could not think that he was of such a high rank. She realized that he was going to the station, for there was only one reason why such a neat gentleman could be in a hurry to go somewhere in a dirty alley. She realized that he was going down the back alley, which was the shortest and quickest way to the station, noticing that the girl was quite bright. He asked her to wait in the next room for a while, for he needed to consult with his family. Sitting at the door, she hoped that she had not made any mistakes. She did not even hope that she would be appointed as a kitchen maid or dishwasher and was willing to clean even the stables and asked to be taken at least for a trial period. Sitting on the chair, Maria thought about taking her in because there was food and a place to live in the temple and she was trained. But if she went to the temple, the girl would have to become a nun, which was not a good option. The man realized that if they had such a young maid, there might be some strange rumors. So he thought about raising her and just letting her live in the mansion. Because when the girl came in, he said the ad had been published over six months ago. And in that time, they had already hired three maids. And since she said that she could do anything they asked her to do, he said that he would give her five gold coins every week. The girl was very surprised because for her, it was a huge amount. However, she realized that they would not give her such a large amount of money for nothing and assumed that he wanted her to become the subject of his collection because the prince's hobby is to collect stuffed animals. He didn't know how to explain to her. After all, she had never had a daughter, so he didn't know what girls usually do since Maria grew up in the countryside and offered to be his adopted daughter. When the girl suggested that it was a certain kind of maid, Maria laughed and explained that she would not be a maid but rather the maids would take care of her. A man came into the office and said that the prince was expecting his highness the prince. But Kaylin said that since he was talking, the servant had to leave and not interfere. The girl realized that the prince's family was probably very noble, for others would not have been able to treat the royal family so coldly. He explained that he couldn't make her work because she was too small, but he didn't want to leave her to live on the street. So she could just live in the house. She knew that becoming a Cullen's daughter meant becoming the most honorable girl in the land, but at the same time it meant entering the house of a prince whose hands were stained with blood. She didn't know if it was luck or bad luck, but one thing is for sure, it's a once-in-a-lifetime chance, so she accepted. Maria was surprised that the prince was already leaving because he didn't even know her name, but Kaylin explained that he didn't need the name she had on the street and he was going to give her a new one. The girl shouted out saying that her name was Lei, because that's what her mother called her. Lei in the ancient language means Monday. That's the day she was born. Then the girl was led into the bathroom, which was larger than the hall she had been in before. The butler said that a maid would be coming soon to help her, but she asked to ask him only one question. She explained that the prince had asked her to be his daughter, and she didn't know what that meant. She didn't understand why the prince would bring an orphan into his house and what she was supposed to do now. Sion decided to tell her honestly as an adult, in rich and noble families of course they rarely adopt, but it is quite possible, in fact there were cases when there was only one child in the family, and for his sake, they took another as a friend. It can also be a type of charity to give orphans an education and make them outstanding children. And if Lei grows into a worthy lady of this family, 
all around will praise the prince for his mercy. The girl realized that if she became an outstanding woman, she would be able to thank the prince in this way, and did not know what the percentage of probability of survival of a beggar like her in this world, full of killers. And here she could study and always be fed, even if it was charity. But even for that she would always be grateful and never forget. The butler apologized for his rude words and promised that from now on, he would address her as a member of this family. He also wanted to add that the prince is not the kind of person who likes other people. He does not show kindness to everyone. But the most important thing for her was to be healthy and grow up in a peaceful environment. The girl did not know if she could be healthy and grow up in a peaceful environment because she was adopted by a homicidal maniac who had already killed 107 people. Naturally, Kaylin was not an ordinary homicidal maniac. He was a top-level dark mage who was born once every 500 years. There is a curse on dark mages of your level, according to which they can survive only by killing people. To exist, it is necessary to absorb the magic power of human bodies, and the more they absorb it, the stronger they become. They are called magic absorbers. After this became known to the whole family, it was decided to raise Kaelin as a weapon, and even the royal family got involved. And so there he was, a villain killing villains, a serial killer destroying other serial killers, this royal special unit of only one man. But he was no danger to her, because he was on the side of justice, something like a hero. When the maids finally came to the girl and helped her out of the bath and wrapped her in a towel, she wondered if it was possible to wipe her body with such a soft cloth. After a while, she was changed into clean clothes. Looking at herself in the mirror, she was surprised that her hair was such a color, and her clothes were like an angel. After that, the girl was brought to the dining room where there was still no one, and sitting and looking at the table full of food, she hoped that everyone would come as soon as possible. After 20 minutes, she couldn't control herself and persuaded herself to try at least a little because she hadn't eaten such delicious food for a long time. In her previous life, she had no appetite because of her illness, so she had not eaten much before she came here. She didn't notice Jade, the prince's son, entering the dining room, saying that even though she was small, she had eaten so much. She was surprised to see him there. She hadn't heard him come in, but she was sitting in his seat and probably looked bad. She wanted to get up, but the guy held her back, saying that her seat was opposite his and next time she should sit there. The girl was very upset and downcast, and when asked by the guy what had happened, she said in tears that she had eaten all his food. And she explained that if her friends managed to beg something from passers-by, they always shared even the smallest piece of bread with each other. She wanted to be friends with him, but since she ate it all, Jade might think she was a glutton. The man calmed her down by telling her not to worry about it, because he was just watching her eat, so he didn't let on that it was unusual. After talking to her, he wondered why she ate only once a day. It turned out that she just ate too much at one meal because she had nothing to eat. So he told her to keep eating because it was funny to watch her while eating. Her cheeks puffed up and she looked like a popo. That was the name of the cat she used to have. And as soon as she saw food, she would lose her head and eat more than her own body and always kept in his teeth tasty things so that no one would take them away. He was very fond of this cat, even though she died as a result of a failed experiment. The girl wondered what kind of experiment he was conducting but in her heart, she hoped he wasn't going to experiment on her too. He explained that he only changed the environment in which she was, placed her in a warm place, prepared a bed for her, and even gave her medicine, but there was no special effect because she was dying. The girl looked at him in surprise, for it was not an experiment, but a simple care for a sick pet, and tried to remember what Jade was like in the book. He was very unsociable, and he lived in his own world. He didn't even let his father interfere in his life, but he wasn't bad, and realized that everything was just like in the book, saying that his cat was probably grateful for that experiment, and to thank and be friends with him she wanted to, because it was because of him, she was able to stay there because she wanted to be friends as a token of appreciation. Even though it was still his father's decision if Jade was against it, he would have kicked her out because the boy was his precious son. The boy said that brother and sister couldn't be friends, however they could be in a close relationship, and watching the girl chowing down on food was quite amusing. He also wanted to know about that red flower with gold stripes, if she was sure that she definitely got it from someone. The girl answered in the affirmative, not realizing what was wrong. When he thought about it, Cullen had a serious look on his face too. Did they think she had actually stolen it? When he asked why his father had decided to adopt her, 
She said that she didn't know, because she had never killed anyone or been an accomplice, and no one would die by her hand from now on. She had never done anything else, though once she was falsely accused of stealing a purse, but she hadn't stolen it, and just wanted to pick up the purse that had fallen to the ground. After all these questions, Lee realized that he was just trying to see if she was just fun for Kaylin, and she wasn't sure if she had done the right thing by going there. She couldn't remember the face of the man who'd slapped her after the false accusation, but Jade had said that if she remembered, she'd tell him, and he'd make her play with his head like a ball. She agreed with him, saying that if she remembered, she would tell him, but in her heart she knew that even if she remembered, she would never tell him, because she was afraid. In the evening, Cyan read the prince all the available information about the girl. He managed to find out that her name was Lee, and her age was nine years. She was born in the poor neighborhood of Setan, belonging to Levelton, the only relative of her mother who died because of illness. After that, she lived in the back alleys begging, never got involved with criminal gangs, and never did anything criminal. The prince adopted her because of that flower, because such a flower could not be found, even if you turned the whole country upside down, and she could not have accidentally brought it. The red bell with golden stripes is a challenge to fight the criminal who killed his mother, and he thought Mrs. Lay was his target. After all, perhaps she is the next victim or accomplice, whoever she turns out to be. The prince planned to leave her here and observe. However, the nine-year-old girl didn't look like a spy. She looked cute, but he didn't want to fall for it. And Mr. Jade, who had shown absolutely no feelings after the death of this chimera, should have just stayed in the house too. Just then the prince asked if Sion was sure he was sure the chair could move. This as it turned out, the butler had just given him too small a dose. They knew that the man had killed 30 people, some of which had gone into his collection, but had not yet returned the pieces of his collection to the relatives of the murdered victims. The prince wondered how to prepare it, and suggested that they split it into 30 pieces to send to the families of the victims as a souvenir. Almost all the girl remembered from her past life was reading books in the White Hospital Ward. She had told her mother about wanting to catch criminals when she grew up, but unfortunately, her health was rather poor. She aspired so much to be like the graceful and strong Levelton family, but vaguely remembered the days of Prince Levelton, but it turned out that was the last book she read while she was alive. When she woke up in the morning, she realized that she was once again dreaming about her past life and did not understand why she could not remember the contents of the book. Perhaps it was because of the dream, because every morning she woke up and began to doubt the reality. Jade said that the prince wasn't here today because his father was always busy, but today, he had gone to the suburbs for an inspection. Jade realized that the inspection in the suburbs was just an excuse when Kaylin was away on a mission and decided not to ask about it again. Every morning she and Jade had breakfast together and he watched her eat today. Jade was still a closed person to her, but they had grown closer and now Lee called him by his first name. She hoped that they would get closer and asked if he was busy today and if he had any time to spend with her. But the boy told her that he wouldn't be there today because he had to go to the academy, but instead she could play with the balloon Sion had given her. The girl was delighted and couldn't believe that it was really hers because balloons were only given on special days, even though in her past life, her father had sometimes brought them to the hospital. Jade looked at her with incomprehension and saw that she was crying with joy again but he didn't think she would like the simplest and most ordinary balloon so much. As she drank milk tea brewed from the tea leaves of the Rogel Empire, the girl realized that she had had too amazing a start to the day. After breakfast during the walk, he told her that the prince's family was the oldest in the empire. It had its own history, as the prince was the only one in the capital who owned so much land. Originally, all of the prince's relatives lived there, but they all moved away. So now the houses were empty, in the distance stood a small ancient temple. There are stored precious items from the collection of the prince, therefore it was forbidden to enter. Suddenly the girl saw a carriage rushing towards them, from which Maria emerged a few moments later. She was glad to see them and told them that there was already a lot of talk about the prince's adopted daughter, even though Sion had tried to stop the spread of the articles in the newspapers. Gossip spreads information much faster than newspapers. The society girls tensed all their receptors keenly reacting to every movement of the handsome prince. Maria then turned her attention to the girl and the outfit she was wearing, 
thinking it was too big for her and terribly old-fashioned. She was a little disappointed, but she knew that even though the lovely little lady had come to the house, her brother had not bought what she needed. And since Kaylin was not at home, she decided to take the girl with her. Despite the protests of Cyan, who said that all of the young lady's outings had to be coordinated with the prince. Maria went on to say that she was nine years old, a grown-up lady at that age, and that she should choose what women liked, not what men liked. If anything, you can call Cullen at the atelier. He's probably sitting in the hotel under the pretext of a trip out of town. As they rode in the carriage, Maria said that the girl had seemed Mila to her last time, and now she saw that she was very pretty. And as she had a trained eye, she saw the point at once. She apologized for leaving without saying goodbye last time, because there were guests in the temple. She worked in the temple and had a simple job as a holy maiden. The girl was delighted and misunderstood, for she did not know whether she meant what she thought, whether it was the maiden she had imagined. After a while they were already in the city, the girl through the window saw a toy store, looking at the store window with rapt attention. She had only recently been a beggar, and for her, looking at store windows and toys was the highest luxury, because the shopkeepers did not like it when vagrants hung around. One day, the owner forgot to turn off the lamp that illuminated the window, closed the store and went home. Lei looked at the toys. It was amazing, as if she was in paradise. That time she stood in front of the store window all night, but now she realized that if she was with Maria, she might be able to go into the toy store and touch a doll. They arrived at the place where all the young ladies bought clothes, Seville's store, and she needed to buy as many things as possible, even though she was only nine years old. But if she lived in the prince's house, she would have to appear in many places. As soon as they were seen, several maids rushed to greet them because their honorary customer had arrived and also informed them that they had a new shipment of silk and asked what dress she wanted. When Maria said that the dress would not be for her today, she pointed to this young lady and said that she was now a new member of the family. The maids looked at her uncertainly and wondered how much they expected to pay, but didn't think when they asked Levelton herself. The woman said that to begin with the amount was 100 zloty. They had to make sure that they spent all the money. The girl in her mind had already started to calculate how much it was and realized that if the salary of one maid is one gold, then 100 coins is about 100 million because she rushed to say that she should not have spent so much because it is a huge amount. She was not her own daughter and didn't understand how she could spend so much money on her. She was also afraid that the prince would consider her too expensive and kick her out. She was already surrounded by maids, saying that they had many dresses that would suit the young lady. First, they took the balloon from her, saying that they would take it for safekeeping, and the next item was to take her measurements. While the maids were bringing a lot of outfits, Maria asked to bring anything more expensive to match the prince's family, and didn't understand how they were going to dress such a beautiful child in the rags they brought. While flipping through the catalog, Maria still liked one of the dresses, after which the girl was led to the fitting room for the guests of honor. This dress was intended for evenings, and the princess herself had ordered a similar model. The girl could not believe that the same dress was the princess herself. On her way out, she heard the maid saying hello to Lady Roger, who was indignant and asked to be served by her maid, saying that she was not going to tolerate it, for she was about to become a princess, and the others were busy with some stepdaughter. She realized that she didn't have the prince's magical blood in her as Jade had, and there was talk about this girl in the society. Maria heard the rumors and realized that the aristocrats were aristocrats and could not treat the lower classes differently. Mrs. Roger thought that education was a problem and didn't understand how she could make a human being out of her, and there was still a way to marry her off early and send her to live in the village. It sounded good, but on the condition that the girl was beautiful, Otherwise, who would want to marry an ugly girl? But she didn't listen to people talking badly about her looks, and maybe everyone had strange tastes. The girl listening to all this wanted to go out as inconspicuously as possible, so as not to catch her eye. She had seen such people many times, and they all looked at her with contempt. But she tried to pretend as if everything was all right, because she was used to it. Maria looked at her and suggested to the maids to make them the same dress for they just had a model of similar design. It was her longtime dream to wear the same dress with her relative. The girl was glad that Maria looked happy, 
She was put on a chair and told to rest while they brought her something to drink. She looked at the windowsill where her balloon should have been. She noticed it wasn't there and rushed out of the store into the street, realizing it was the first present from Jade. She was downcast because she hadn't seen it anywhere and she'd promised her boyfriend she'd keep it. A hand reached out to her and a voice asked her if she wanted a fortune teller because if you know your destiny from childhood, you can be prepared for the future. The fortune teller tried to pull her in, saying that only one silver coin would be enough for her, but the girl, gathering all her strength, managed to break free and ran wherever she was going. She didn't notice how she ended up near the toy store she had longed to go to, but now her balloon was much more important to her. She started looking around when she realized she didn't know where she was. The dress she was wearing didn't even belong to her, and she had just run away without telling anyone. She was crying because one of the passers-by hit her, and she fell down. But she realized that she shouldn't get her dress dirty, and she didn't know how to get back up. Suddenly, she noticed a bird flying near her, and the prince was beside her, wondering if she had already decided to run away from home. She tried to explain that while Mrs. Maria was changing her clothes, she wanted to find her balloon that Jade had given her, because she had promised that she would keep it. But unfortunately, she had lost it. The girl wondered how he recognized her from the crowd, because the last time he had seen her, he had not seen her in her best clothes. When the man looked at her, he explained that she was radiant as when he first met her. So he recognized her at once. There was an angel on the road, and he came up, and it was Lee. From his words, Lei was embarrassed because he knew how to say nice things and assumed that this is what real aristocrats did. When the prince brought the girl back to the atelier, she was rushed by the maid, who after her sudden disappearance was very frightened and was even going to call the police. When the prince said that the girl had lost her balloon, the maid apologized because another customer said that he was stuffy and asked to open the windows where the balloons flew out. On seeing the prince, Lady Roger came up to them and smilingly said that if she had known he was coming, she would have booked a table at the restaurant in advance, for they had seldom seen each other lately. When she saw Leo in his arms, she asked who it was, for she had heard that he had adopted a poor commoner. The woman leaned toward her and said that they should have been friends, for they were soon to be a family. But she was a liar, for she had other things on her mind. Lady Roger said she respected his hobbies, of course, for charity work was important and wondered if he had found a teacher for her. She said that she had a teacher she knew who could teach her properly. He was very strict if necessary and even practiced beatings such a person would be useful to them to hide her origins. The man lowered the girl to the floor and told her to try calling him father, but she was shy, and they decided to begin with another, for he had another request. He asked her to tell the lady to come out of there at once. Lady Roger did not quite understand the indirect speech, so the prince told her to get out of his sight. It would be good if she did not flash before him from now on. The girl watched his conversation with surprise, but if you think about it, Cullen would always have such a character. And maybe she was wrong to think that he was without humanity. He leaned over to the girl and told her to say goodbye and not to worry, because she would never see this man again. The girl did not know who she was, but it was a relief to her that she was not as beautiful as this lady. For if she had been so beautiful, she would have had to marry early. Or Lady Roger thought she should have been sold to the circus, to which the woman asked angrily why she went everywhere and eavesdropped on other people's words. The prince intervened and said that she should have refrained from threatening his daughter to begin with, and he did not understand why she had not yet complied with his request to leave. The woman parried that it was not his house, but the general store, but turning around she saw the maids already collecting all her purchases and things. The prince said that this street completely belongs to him. He thought that she knew that. That's why she was meddling, and he was disappointed because he likes more Soviet people. The woman came up to him and pressed herself against him, asking him how he could do that, since they were a couple and were dating. Cullen grinned and said that he didn't think she was so naive, because having dinner a couple times didn't mean dating, and if they were so sure of their relationship, they should have pretended that the woman had blown him off first. So he said it was time for her to leave before he called security, and the next thing he knew he saw was her back walking away. When Maria came out to them, the prince noticed that she was wearing the same outfit as two weeks ago, and not only had she not tried on the new flesh, but she was wearing what she had worn before. The prince wanted her to know how much trouble his younger sister was causing him, 
who was attracted to men, but she was a holy virgin for her special profession. The woman rebuked him for having dated Lady Roger himself, but the man replied that he had already broken up with her because she had rejected him, whereupon the woman pointed to a mountain of shopping. The girl was very glad that they had taken her out to town today, but it seemed to her that they had not spent all that money properly. When the prince inquired how much she had spent, and heard that it was only 100 gold pieces, asking her to give her all the silk and gems, he said she was wrong. Lei exhaled, because she had done the right thing. But then, she was even more shocked, because she heard the prince say that she should have spent 200, and offered to give the store an advance, so that next time they would prepare the best silks. Lei said that she had enough children's outfits since she already had five of them at home, but it was impossible to fill the dressing room with only five outfits. They would not be enough to just go out for the evening. Although it was not very convenient, but the prince replied that it was on him to worry since it was part of the guardian's duties. Though the girl hadn't heard that there was a duty to spend a huge amount of money on shopping and realized that she wasn't acting on them anything when the prince asked to bring a few more dresses. Then the girl realized that she had one last way left and said that she was so tired that fatigue made her eyes close that it finally worked on them. Though Maria said they would have more fun next time, the prince replied that she didn't know how to handle children, and there were to be no more outings without his permission. When they were about to go home, the girl remembered that she had not been able to find her sherik and did not know what she would tell her wife. In the crowd, she noticed a woman who was very pale and immediately fell down right in front of them, asking for help. The prince approached her and said that she had no pulse. The woman was dead even though she had no visible wounds. A policeman came up to them. When he recognized Prince Levelton, he said he had a few questions for him, but it was just a mere formality. The deceased woman's name was Venets Ali. She had no disease, presumed cause of death was a heart attack. She was said to be the daughter of a merchant who owned several seafood stores. The book described that the capital was not only rich in crime, but also had many strange deaths. Lei did not understand whether this is really a common heart attack. She wanted to know the full content of this story. Although, when they met, she was brave, but now just shaking with fear. The girl also remembered the woman who offered her a fortune telling, but the prince replied that she was absolutely fine. When they arrived home, the servants and his son Jade were surprised that they had returned together, but the prince simply explained that something had happened on the way. The girl confessed to the boy that she had lost Sharik and told the whole story saying that in the end, she had never been able to find him. He asked her not to cry because it could be replaced and could not believe that she liked the balloon so much, suggesting that next time she should go to play in the boat, then tried to comfort her. Then the boy offered to walk her to her room for she must be very tired and Lee glowed and agreed to his proposal. The prince had so far learned that this child named Lei was very sweet and nothing more. It did not matter whether it would help him or not, but he was sure that everything would be all right. But thanks to his messages managed to find her immediately. However, raising a child is not easy. It was the first time the girl had seen a gramophone that worked with a magic stone. It was her first magical object. As it turned out, Jade is 14 years old, and she wondered whether he can drink wine, because he is still underage, because all members of their kind are badly affected by alcohol and medicine. She said that the girl could not drink wine until she was at least half Jade's height. The prince unfolded the envelope and saw that his majesty had sent him a riddle, a heart attack of unknown cause, which was the first case. The second case could be taken as an accident, but it seemed that after the third case the delegation had taken over, for the three women had died in different places. The only thing they had in common was their red hair, but they were all of different status, and it was clear that this would turn out to be a good and famous case. When the prince touched her forehead, she realized it was happening again. She heard a voice that said that today was August 9th, Tuesday. This time, the target was a little girl commoner. They wanted her to check if her mother was doing well in heaven. All she had was the name she had given her. It was a pity, but she immediately succumbed to the temptation. No one would look for this poor girl. She wasn't treated the same as the other women, even though she had beautiful hair color. It was the last words before the girl's left arm was cut off. Lei woke up wondering what date today was, and when she heard that it was August 9th, she realized that it was the day that the poor girl named Lee would be killed. 
If we recall the book of Prince Levelton's days on the seventh chapter of the murder of the fortune teller, the truth was that the culprit had a mother who was too much attached to him. He simultaneously loved her and hated her. Experiencing these contradictory feelings, he suddenly realized that he wanted to take her place. This attachment to his mother switched to a victim with the same red hair as hers, a fortune teller offering miracle beauty products to girls, which temporarily made her skin blush which made her attractive, but was actually a slow-acting poison that after a while caused cardiac arrest. And the fact that the woman with the red hair died of cardiac arrest was no accident. Then when she met in the alley, there is a criminal is a real murder. So she turned to the prince asking if the deaths he spoke of had any common signs that could have been an elaboration. She suggested that the victim was a fortune teller. Red hair is certainly an important clue, but it doesn't suggest a fortune teller. She explained that most fortune-telling houses were in poor alleys, and she'd heard that even aristocrats were known to go to fortune-tellers. As for the restaurant or clothing stores, people usually only go to those that fit. The place where people of different classes can come is just the house of the red-haired fortune-teller. After she told her about it, the girl felt that the pain was getting worse and she lost consciousness again. She again saw pictures from the future, where in the room where she was kept in the cage entered the prince. Having disposed of the fortune teller, he approached her promising to send her to the doctor. Suddenly, however, an arrow flew into him, which plunged straight into his chest, and the man fell dead, and behind his back was the criminal himself. As the girl got out of bed, she realized that she wasn't the only one connected to the crime. Tonight, Cullen will be wounded by an arrow and will fall into a coma. This arrow was poisoned with a potent poison. The best doctors and priests from across the empire will be summoned but Cullen will lie unconscious for a month. As soon as this is known, a whole line of people will come to the prince's house, most of them those who have taken the prince's debt or those who want to pull the young heir to their side. Some of them will try to destroy the prince, that's all she knew about the future. Because when she read this episode, she fainted and it was the last page she read. She didn't understand why she had remembered such an important detail only now and she couldn't tell Cullen about the fortune teller. When the girl opened her eyes again, she realized that she was in her room and everyone was looking at her with worried looks. She hoped that she had not said anything in her dream. At the same time, the prince received the results of the investigation he had asked for. Looking there, the girl saw there a report on the traces of crime at the murder scene of the victims with red hair. She realized that if he read it, tonight, he would go to the house of the fortune teller. Because she understood that it was necessary to prevent the events which were described in the book and did not know what to tell him. Because you cannot tell that they live in the world about which she read in the novel in her past life. The prince realized that the only place that all those women visited was the fortune-telling house of the red-haired fortune-teller. Everything was exactly as the girl had said, too much to be an accident. He assumed that he had been lured there on purpose. The girl took him by the hand and cried and asked him not to go there. She had dreamed that the prince would suffer greatly, and in her dream, everything was very clear, and now she was worried. So she asked him to stay at home so that she would not worry. But hearing the silence, she assumed that he was angry with her. But to her surprise, the prince agreed to stay at home, saying that it was more important for him that the girl was calm and he was not angry with her. The girl began to cry again, and when the boys could not calm her down, they sent Cyan for a sedative, for they did not know what to do with her. When he came back, the girl was still sitting on the bed, though she thought she had calmed down, but the tears did not stop. The girl said she couldn't sleep alone tonight because the prince had to stay with her. The prince was amused because it wasn't even his own daughter, but even Jade had a feeling that it wasn't worth going there. The man put her to sleep, for she would get better sooner. She was afraid to go to bed and sleep and could not rest until the night was over. The man realized that the only way to calm her down was to lie down next to her. So he and Jade lay down on either side of the girl and promised they wouldn't go anywhere. As the boys fell asleep, the girl realized that they were lying there as if they were really a family. But she didn't know what the foster daughter's position was or if she could consider them a real family. Though she had just been very awake, the medication always made her sleepy and she extracted a promise from the prince that he would not leave even if she fell asleep. She decided to get up early in the morning and file a police report, because if they catch the culprit, Cullen will be unharmed. 
However, she fell asleep. Then the prince began to pack, realizing that Jade liked this girl because he also had an interest in her. He thought she was going to give him some information, but she just started crying and telling him not to go there, which was a mystery. In any case, whether it was a trap or not, he would only know if he went there. But Sion thought that the red flower meant that the criminal had brought the girl as a spy. But since the prince thought it was more complicated than that, his assumptions could be important. That's where his hunt began. When the girl woke up in the morning, she went to the police to make a report before Cullen woke up. But when she turned around, she didn't see him. So she rushed to Jade, who was lying on the couch and said that his father had come out at dawn, saying that he had to find out something. She realized that this prince would not listen to her and she could not fall asleep. So she said that she had a favor to ask Jade. She asked if Jade could ride, and when she heard a positive answer, she asked him to trust her, because she would do anything to thank him. The guy sighed heavily, and said that in that case he would do it, and then they went to the stables. He helped her to get on the horse, and then they set off, and the girl showed the way. After a while, they arrived at the fortune teller's house. Jade realized that she had come to look for her father, and assumed that they would just go back, since his father wasn't there anyway. Jade, who had promised to help her, went with her to the fortune teller's house. As she leaned against the door, she realized that suddenly everything was quiet and worried that something had already happened to Cullen. If her guess was right, there was either someone hiding in the room or a gang of fortune tellers. So she asked Jade to grab whoever was hiding near the door because he was stronger than the average adult. As they were about to open the door, the girl was worried, and though it was scary, she realized that she didn't want them to look for something that had happened. When they came in, they saw the prince dealing with the fortune teller with magic. When he saw the children, he told Jade to take the girl and leave, for it was too early for her to see such things. Lee realized that there was no one else there, and she didn't quite know who had fired the shot, but she concluded that it was the trap with the rifle rig. Jade broke free of Jade's grip and ran screaming that he couldn't be there and the arrow had hit her. The prince turned to her saying that she shouldn't lose consciousness, but a memory flashed before him of her parents telling her the same thing before she was taken away for surgery. So gathering all her strength, she turned to the prince calling him daddy and apologized for what she had done. Cyan entered the house apologizing for being late, because when he found out that the young lady and the Lord had disappeared, he went back to them immediately but he didn't understand what was going on. Cullen's father was the eldest in the Levelton family. He envied Kaelin, who was a more capable mage than himself. He was both jealous of Cullen and afraid of him. The boy was loved only by his mother. He was often beaten like some animal, and he hid behind his mother who protected him. She protected him as best she could, promising that she would always love him, and sometimes she got it instead of Cullen. The day she died, it felt like the whole world had fallen apart, just as it did now when he held the poor girl from the street named Lei in his arms. He'd adopted her because of his memorial whim and didn't understand why she'd saved his life. Even though she saw him kill a man, it didn't disgust her. But pulling himself together, he began to give orders to Zion, telling him to tie up the man lying on the ground. Turning to Jade, he asked her to put something in her mouth so she wouldn't bite her tongue because he would try to stop the blood and she might feel pain. He used his magic to stop the bleeding, realizing that she needed to be moved to a safe place. Cyan said that there was a prince's hotel nearby and they could go there. A doctor was called and the prince inquired as to her condition. The doctor replied that more details could be given when the surgeon arrived, but that there was no danger to her life at the moment. The arrow was not poisoned and fortunately did not hit the heart. The prince breathed out a sigh of relief saying that if she died, he would destroy absolutely all the doctors in this city. Sitting down next to the girl, he realized that there were only two options. Either she was a spy of that killer with the red flower, or she was his target. At first he thought that the information she had given last night was a trap or an accident, but he could not have foreseen such a thing. He didn't want her to get hurt instead of him, and it was better if it was a trap. So he turned to her and told her that she had to survive and take responsibility for her words. Because if she called him father, then there was a kinship between them. And it didn't matter even if she wasn't his own, because he could make her his daughter when she started, he should change the training. He wanted to raise her to be arrogant and selfish, so she wouldn't care if an arrow or a knife flew at someone right in front of her. 
But first, he'd have to keep her locked up like a greenhouse. He'd feel better that way. Every possible doctor was gathered around the girl, saying there was absolutely nothing life-threatening. Jade had waited until the operation was over, and now he was resting in his room. The first time they had ever seen the young lord restless, the prince wanted to send the man to the temple, for the high priests would surely know magic techniques to remove the pain. However, he contacted people, but today there was an event at the imperial palace, and most of the high priests had gone there. They promised to send someone as soon as it was over. So now he asked Zion to listen carefully to everything he has to say, and to deliver it word for word to the emperor. If the emperor didn't send those high priests there right away, he would go to the palace himself and make the first person in the imperial family who caught his eye suffer the same suffering that his daughter was suffering. Jade sat beside the girl's bed, wondering if perhaps it would be better to make an effigy of Popo. He remembered the first time he'd seen such an unusual cat. But as the prince had explained, it wasn't just a cat. It was a chimera. A chimera is a magical animal that shares life with the one it belongs to. If one shoots or dies, it will affect the other. And from that day on, he became the master of this baby, taking care of it as if it were his own. As he later found out, it was a brazen lie, and the sick look was even more reminiscent of his cat. He would have liked to see the girl talk and laugh again, but she did something he couldn't imagine, and he chastised himself for not believing her. It was strange to him that she had sacrificed herself to save her father, and he felt his heartache. After a while, she opened her eyes and remembered that she had saved Kaelin because someone had let the arrow in. She felt that she had no voice and was afraid that she was dead again and in the other world. She felt someone nearby and turned to see Jade, but she didn't understand why he was sleeping there. She was glad she was alive, glad that Cullen was alive, even though the poisoned arrow would have hit him, and she wanted to say something, but her voice was gone. Jade noticed this and handed her a glass of water, which she drank and was able to speak. She was in the hospital, the prince was unharmed, and she had been unconscious for a week. Coming out of the ward, they saw a lot of doctors, who seeing the girl began to cry and rejoice that she was alive, and they were saved. When they saw her shoulder wounded by an arrow, they started to say that she would survive and come to her senses soon, and that there were no poisonous substances in the arrow. But later it turned out that the arrow had been laced with a narcotic drug which is not easy to detect, so they couldn't find it at first. She was still too young to be in a critical state. Even a small dose would have been enough to put her in a critical state. Even though the arrow had hit her, it was a relief for the girl. She could have spent her whole life in a coma because of the drug. She didn't know if she was lucky, but she had to think positive. But Jade still didn't understand why the doctors were happy to say they were saved. But Jade, as well as the girl, knew about her father's strange character when she was unconscious. For a whole week, her father was very angry and walked up and down the hall like a madman, repeating that he hated it when anyone sacrificed anything for him. And if anything happened to his daughter, he'd take his anger out on the first person he saw. Lee understood that he was definitely weird. But if you thought positively, it meant that he just cared about her a lot. Lei went on to say that after the conversation with her father, they were going to draw lots. If the girl didn't wake up today, the lot would be cast on one of those stupid doctors to show how they planned to punish them. As she pulled one of the papers out of the box, the girl realized that this punishment meant death. She didn't understand why, because the doctors weren't guilty of anything. Jade said they were seven of the best doctors in the capital. They were invited there when the girl was injured. It was the Imperial Palace that helped gather them. After that, the doctors entered the room to examine her, and said that she was guaranteed to recover this time. They said that the girl was lucky for the Empire. If something had happened to her, the consequences would have been very serious. Jade said that luck was clearly on their side as they had already prepared the draw, but this time they were very lucky and the doctors were very grateful. The girl asked him to tell her what had finally happened and what had happened while she was unconscious, why they called it luck. Gigi began to tell. Remembering the fortune teller's house. As it turned out, there were many different traps set there, and the rifle rig that shot the girl was one of them. When the fortune teller turned her ring to the right, an arrow with deadly poison would fly out, and if she turned to the left, an arrow with a narcotic substance would fly out. While the father was holding the man by the throat, the criminal tried to start the mechanism. If the ring turned to the right, 
the deadly poisoned arrow would fly out. In the book, Cullen was hit by the deadly poisoned arrow, and Jade explained the perp's motives to her. He was obsessed with his mother, and pretended to be a fortune teller so he could find and kill women with red hair like hers. But it was similar to what she knew before. But Jade thought the criminal was really a real scumbag, because he said that the arrows with the drug were meant for women because he was sorry to kill them right away. It was scary to hear the stories of all the criminals in the world, but thank God everything was all right now because his father had punished him. The boy asked her if she was in pain, for a piece of meat had been torn from her shoulder and even the bones were visible. And there was a crack in the bone and she could die from loss of blood. But he told her not to worry, for the high priests had been using magic for a week to take away the pain, so she would not feel it for some time. They were now waiting in the next room. She had heard that people who used holy magic were very valuable, but Jade had told them not to worry because they were willing to drain them of the last of their vitality if it would only keep her pain away. Because his aunt was a holy maiden, and if she was so worried about it, she could thank them with a generous donation. The girl realized that this was the world of the rich and realized that saving Cullen was really no small matter. Jade had a lot of questions for her, but the first one was why she had done it, because if the arrow had hit his father, he would have gotten nothing and didn't understand why she had framed herself instead of him. The girl explained that even if the arrow had a drug in it, it could be very dangerous when it hit the heart, and she didn't want the prince to get hurt and everyone to be sad about it. Jade was glad that everyone was alive, that was the main thing. Also, he said that she was very unusual, and also brave and braver than many people he knew. The girl realized that Cullen and Jade were both not quite ordinary, and it wasn't even worth trying to understand them. So she wasn't surprised when the boy apologized for not believing him and for being angry with him at the fortune teller's house. She didn't know how to explain to him what she'd said. She couldn't admit that she'd read it in a book and was glad he hadn't asked her about it yet. She decided to change the subject by saying that she was hungry and wanted to sleep. After the food had been cooked, she was satisfied and thought she could live now and asked where the prince was. Jade said that her father was at home and he would send a man to call him there. But Lei didn't want to see him. She didn't have to see him as she hadn't made an excuse yet. She had seen Cullen kill a man and she was afraid to imagine what he could do to her to keep her quiet. She explained to the boy that she would be glad if the prince came, but he was very busy. And even if he couldn't visit her in the hospital, it was no big deal. She had thought that he had come to visit her once, at least when they arrived at the hospital. But as it turned out, he was there every day, and now he had just gone away for a little while. The girl looked at him fearfully, assuming that he was so angry that he was always coming to see her, perhaps waiting to kill her. Then Jade left her, saying that they would talk about the incident when her father came, and the girl did not know what to do. Is it possible to make up that she does not remember anything and for the shock received from the wound. But she realized that Cullen would not fall for such a thing, and she racked her brains to come up with something. At the same time, the prince and Sion were looking around the house and didn't know what the police were doing, because while they weren't there, everything had turned red. However, he asked Sion to call the police, because there was a corpse of a boy under them. According to the results of the investigation, it was a boy who sold flowers on the street. According to the children, he told the aristocrats where to get medicine and served as a middleman, and perhaps he was related to a fortune teller, the boy selling flowers. The prince thought he had recently heard something similar and assumed that the flowers were needed to hide the body in, but there were too many of them in the room. It was the children in the alley who testified about this boy, for it was they who said that sometimes he gave them the leftover flowers. That first day, the girl said that someone had given her a flower so this boy had died, and they had to check immediately. At the same time, the girl was sitting on the bed, thinking how she could explain her deed. But she was distracted when the prince and Zion flew into the room. She did not understand what had happened and what was in their faces, assuming that the prince was very angry and did not know what to do in such a situation. But suddenly he came to her and hugged her tightly. He apologized to her for coming so late, for he had some business to attend to, and he was glad that she was all right for he was very much worried. So far, the girl had been living on the street, and if she was sick or alone, she just put up with it. She had friends, and during her illness, she had to take care of herself. And today, 
For the first time, she experienced the feeling of being cared for by someone, though she realized that she must not get used to this feeling, otherwise she would hope and wait for it. The prince brought a red flower to her and asked her if she knew anything about him, but the girl simply said that he was beautiful and nothing more. The man had a lot to say, and for starters he thanked her for saving him. But next time I shouldn't have done that, because he was her guardian and she was his daughter, and it was the father's duty to protect their children. So there was no way she should have thought of sacrificing herself for him, which meant that Colin was worried about her, which the girl was glad about. But he didn't understand why she looked so lethargic, because the doctors had said that when she came to her senses, her life would be safe, and he assumed that the doctors had lied to him again. Kaylin assumed that she had questions for him, that she wasn't interested in who he had killed and what he had taken. But the girl didn't know exactly, but she was sure that the man was bad and that was why he had done it. She knew that Cullen did not touch the innocent, but only those who had killed or were going to kill. That was his unquestionable rule. The man on the other hand only wondered where she came from his life and didn't understand why she had absolutely no fear of him. According to Jade, she had told him that day that something was going to happen at the fortune teller's house and asked him to take her there. So the prince wondered how she knew he was there. She lowered her head and said that she had seen the papers he had left in her room. She didn't know the real reason, but it was a fact that night, Kaylin had left papers in her room that contained an important clue. It seemed strange to her. Why would Kaylin, who was always neat and tidy, need to leave a lead related to a crime? It was about the after-meal report left by a woman with red hair. Kaylin was surprised because the girl could read, but she explained that she didn't know the letters but she had learned almost all the signs from the street where she lived. That night, there was an incident in the house of a red-haired fortune teller, which is not far from her alley, and there lived a fortune teller of tall and sturdy build. There were rumors about her that she traps and devours small children to maintain her magical powers. She saw the familiar letters on the subject papers and thought that he was there, as she said the fortune teller's house was the only thing that united all women. So when she said he was there, she thought the prince had gone there, and it made her feel bad, so she woke Jade and asked him to come with her. The man had a hard time believing it, not because he didn't trust her, but it was like a miracle, so the girl concluded, including a hunch that he was probably investigating the case. But he said that was the end of it, and made her promise that next time she would never do anything like that, and that he would sometimes listen to her opinion because he would ask her often. Leo realized that he had misunderstood, but decided it was better to leave it as it was. When she first came there with the same flower, he was also very surprised, and now he had brought it here, so she wondered what the flower meant. She wondered, for every time the prince looked at it, he had a strange look on his face. She was afraid that she had asked something wrong, for the man was silent. But after a few moments, he answered that the flower had been left by a very, very bad uncle, and he didn't know who he was. Cullen told her briefly about several murder cases and there were these red flowers at the scene of the crimes as if they were some kind of clue. But Cullen didn't know who he was and the girl realized that Cullen had adopted her because she had brought that flower and it wasn't just luck and she didn't know what would happen to her because she liked that family. The man smiled and looked at her and said that she was really fast thinking. At first he didn't doubt and thought she knew anything but she helped him every time he was in a difficult situation, and it didn't matter now, she had saved his life. It was all in the past because father-daughter relationships can be different and now they were fine. That day Cullen told her a lot more, that he punished bad people and did things that the police couldn't do, that was his secret. She had helped him a lot this time, and only Cian and Jade had known about all this information before. But since she was his daughter now, she had a right to know about it too. He hoped that she felt that she had become a real member of the family, that now she knew his secret, she would not be able to leave, and she had to keep it a secret. The man had another question. He asked why she called him Prince, for she should have called him by the word she had already used. The girl had called him Papa, and now he asked her to call him Papa, which he liked. Jade slept in the next room, for he had spent the night with the girl, and the prince assumed that she had the power to charm everyone in the house. Raising her in his arms, he said it was time for them to go home, and as they rode in the carriage, the girl saw many marbles that were now hers. 
Cullen looked at her sincere joy and said that if she wanted, they could stop by the toy store, because he had seen her looking at the toy store that time. The girl was surprised that he still remembered the whole situation when she was looking for her shirik and ended up near the store. When there were festivals on the street, she often saw children who went to the toy store together with their parents. But for her, they were as if from another world. She didn't even dare envy them, and if Cullen was in a good mood today and not busy, maybe she could go to the store like those kids. The man on the other hand said they could go to the toy store anytime she wanted to. After all, he didn't know what she liked, so he just bought the whole store, despite Sion trying to talk him out of it. Sion said that the day before yesterday, the owner went to the toy store to get a gift for the girl when she woke up. But he didn't know what to choose and looked very embarrassed and just bought absolutely everything in advance. The man explained that he didn't know what girls liked, much less had never bought toys. Only once Jade had bought a bear in a military uniform on Maria's advice. But then Jade said that he didn't need to take special care of him, as he did with ordinary children, and wanted to keep a rational father-son relationship between them. Jade confirmed this by saying that he was in favor of stopping all this annoying stuff like birthday presents, because it was the butler who chose his presents anyway, because every year he was given unnecessary things and his father could never have chosen such good presents. The girl wondered why the relationship between father and son was so cold, but more importantly, Cullen had never given Jade a birthday present. The gentleman was not very well versed in children's toys and gifts, and did not understand why his son needs a small bear when there is a stuffed bear that he caught. The girl said that the teddy bear chases away evil spirits when they appear in a bad dream. And when someone has a bad dream, she let them come to her room and hug her since they did not have this toy. Cullen said that he wanted to bite her, and he had a look on his face that he didn't know where to put his face, though she knew how he felt about it but asked him to refrain from saying so. Sion asked her if she wanted something, but since she was still weak, travel was contraindicated and he would bring her what she wanted from the toy store. The prince wondered if it was possible to cancel the purchase of the store and wanted to give it to the girl when she grew up. But she answered that she didn't need the whole store and she would be happy if the prince would choose one toy for her. The man looked at her upset that she called him prince again, but agreed saying that he would buy her the best gift. The girl needed complete rest. She could not get out of bed until the high priests and doctors arrived, but she had absolutely no pain. Her body was stiff from lying down, and she wished she could move around a little. She looked out the window and saw the beautiful moon, remembering that today was supposed to be a full moon. Cullen had said he would listen to her opinion, and she was afraid she couldn't help him. She knew the contents of the book only up to the current events. She remembered the bad man Cullen was talking about and wondered who it could be, because the book only talked about how Cullen was brilliant at solving crimes. And then there was some man who was sending red flowers, and it smelled ominous, and there was something suspicious. It was said that the remedy used by the criminal had no taste or smell, and was from a very rare plant. But she didn't understand how the fortune teller from Poor Lane could get her hands on such a rare thing. She wondered if Cullen had thought the same thing, of course, she had thought more than once how nice it would be if she had a father, because it was lonely to be alone and she couldn't even dream of having a family. But so many good things had happened to her at once that it was frightening, and she was afraid that if she called him daddy, something very bad would happen, that he would get tired of her, or that she would be useless, and he would send her away. So she sat by the window, saying that she would not be too greedy, and asked the moon to make it so that she could stay always in this house. At the same time, a conversation started between the two men. One of them said that they had done away with that flower-selling boy, and that he had left the body at the prominent place. Since he was the intermediary of the fortune teller and knew their faces, there might be trouble. It was unnecessary to give rare potions to that disgusting fortune teller, so they decided to find criminals who would be more useful. And they also noticed that today was a full moon, and in a full moon, everything in the world becomes the same. The man was going to continue to help those who needed him, as planning crimes was his job. And he also heard that the prince had an adopted daughter. She was nine years old. She was too young to receive flowers, so he assumed that his flower was the first one he had received from another person. And it was a curious experiment, because they did not know what she would become in the prince's house. 
Waking up the next morning, Lei saw a very beautiful and soft teddy bear on her bed, but there was something strange about it. It had different colored eyes. She also saw a card beside him and decided to go to Cyan to have him read it. She happily rushed over to the man to show him the gift, but he smiled and said it was a gift from Mr. Cullen and it took a long time to make and in the envelope was written the new name he had given the girl. The girl looked at him confusedly, realizing that she didn't want to lose the name her mother had given her. And besides, aristocrats have very long names, and she didn't know if she could remember it. The prince came to them, and Sion at the same time began to read the note. Now the new name of the princess is Letitia, which meant the sky with a thousand moons. It was also written that the bear would guard Miss Letitia from nightmares, and his eyes were pebbles that complemented her moonlight. The girl, however, realized that her name, or meant the child born on Monday, Cullen had left her real name and made a new one, and she could keep her memories of living on the streets. Many children were born on Monday, and she was one of them. Cullen gave her a moon that could fill the whole sky. The prince was glad that the girl liked her new name, for he had long thought what name would suit her, for their meeting had been unusual. And since the man did not know when exactly she was born, he decided to consider today as her birthday, because the day when she received the name should be with a meaning especially she barely survived. So he wished a happy birthday to his daughter Letitia, and was very surprised when the girl threw herself into his arms and hugged him tightly. She went to show off her present to Jade, and told him that she had a name that her father had given her, and that today would be her birthday. The boy said it was a very beautiful name indeed, and also beautiful were Mishka's gemstones, a red ruby and a blue sapphire. After that, she turned to the prince saying that it would be okay if it was an ordinary teddy bear, but she didn't need expensive stones because she could get used to luxury. The man replied that she was allowed, and he himself hoped that she would become very spoiled and accustomed to wealth, so that others could not cope with her. She had to become one who was worthy to live in the house of the prince. The girl looked at him confusedly and asked if she could be his daughter without jewels. The man agreed but asked her to accept only this toy, and that would be the end of the expensive things. Also on the table was a cake that the prince had secretly ordered the kitchen to prepare. It would be her first birthday cake. Absolutely all the servants surrounded her, congratulating her on her first birthday in the prince's house, her 10th birthday. Her 10th birthday, she met as Letitia and would never forget this happy day. A few years ago, one winter evening, the prince was standing in a toy store picking out a gift for Jade, but didn't know what to choose since the boy already had everything. When they came out of the store, they noticed the children running away from the alleyway because they thought that the shopkeeper was coming out, and they ran away, because usually the shopkeepers chased the children away, thinking that they might steal something. He gave Sian a gold coin and told him to give it to the shopkeeper to keep the lights on tonight because he knew that Jade would throw the toy out anyway, and he wanted to make a good present that would please someone. And that was the night she stood in front of the toy store window all night, and it was all thanks to the prince. It had been a month since she had been Letitia, and she had spent it in the house, and had been told not to go out until she was completely healed, and all the while she had been studying hard to write. The dresses they'd bought with Maria came in and filled her closet, and physically she'd gotten better too. She even got a little fatter, and people even said that she had a light in her eyes and that she was unrecognizable as the girl who had once come to them. Jade had spent the whole summer in her room and she supposed he felt uncomfortable around her. And as she'd been promised, she'd gone boating. Maria spent a lot of time with her, caring and worrying about the girl, hoping that Letitia would grow up to be a beautiful lady and she would like to see her grow up, which was probably how she felt about raising her daughter. Recently, Letitia had learned that Mary could not marry because she was a holy virgin, and sometimes she seemed a little sad. So she said that she wanted to grow up quickly and become like Maria, as beautiful externally and internally as a radiant person like her. Maria was very touched and did not understand where such a kind angel had come from and hoped that Letitia would not take over her drinking habit. Jade came into the room and said that the wine was a joy to drink, and though his aunt had not learned how to drink properly, she was still a good drinker. Letitia was a little disappointed that Maria would not be going on the boat ride with them because there was an event at the temple. The girl at that moment had no idea how the picnic she was looking forward to would turn out. Although the girl would like the prince to be present with them, but today he had to be present at the government meeting 
although he did not have a high position, but he had to be at the meeting. They also saw another boat that was headed for Renock Island, which Jade was not happy about because they were his seniors and they were not on very close terms. Jade asked why he didn't go to the academy because she knew he had to attend every day and grades were very important. The boy said that he was rather an exceptional case because it was possible to pass exams well, a lot of exams to cover the attendance grades. The boy explained that their clan was a clan of hereditary mages, which is very few in the empire. And it was possible to come up with the excuse that he had to go to the magic tower to train. And since he had recently entered with her, she was also complicit in the lie. The girl thought about the fact that the tuition fees in aristocratic schools were very high and dreamed that she would someday be able to study at the academy. But she realized that she could not be greedy and she should be grateful to the prince for allowing her to live in his house. Though Laetitia thought he was teaching him bad things, but the boy thought he was teaching the main thing, for bad and outstanding things are as good as kindness and loyalty. He explained that when she learned to write and read, she would be much smarter. For now, she could write her name and the name of the prince and Jade. Her teacher had told her that it was customary for aristocrats to exchange letters with loved ones, so she wanted to write Jade a letter as well. Jade asked if Letitia missed anyone, and she told him that she had a friend named Walter who lived on the same street with her and helped her a lot. But they agreed that they would pretend they didn't know each other outside that street. They agreed that if one of them got sick and died, or got beaten while begging or got caught and put in an almshouse, even if someone got lucky and went to a good place, they wouldn't look for each other and pretend they knew each other and everyone knew it. They have their morals too, as long as they all help each other. That was the basic rule. One day a flyer was accosted by bad guys. Their rules are to forget everything that happened to them on the street, including these bad guys. She was very lucky because soon it will be winter and winter is very hard. It's awful to have to warm your frozen feet and sleep under a blanket. So she was very grateful to the prince. And about the warm alley, she lied to get a good impression of her. The boy realized it wasn't true, but said she shouldn't have thanked them for it. Naturally, his house was her house now. But the more natural it was, the more grateful she would be, for that was how her mother had taught her in her past life. Then the boy bent down and said that in that case, he should have thanked her more often too, and said thank you for coming to their house and for getting well and going boating with him. The girl felt the warm emotions that came from him and threw herself around his neck, for she was grateful and happy that Jade was her big brother. It would be nice if she could put all these emotions together like a card and keep them in her heart so that if she ever had a hard time again, she could live on remembering these happy moments. When they arrived at the island, they left the boat and Letitia walked around looking at the beauty of the island, marveling at how much space there was. Jade kept her calm and quiet, for she was still sick and must not overexert herself, for she planned to walk all day. She was surprised to see blue roses, but Jade explained that blue roses bloomed once a year for three days on Renock Island, and it was their blooming season. Letitia looked around and noticed that there was no one there, as if someone had rented the whole island and didn't understand why it wasn't full of people if they were such rare flowers. Jade explained that there were bad rumors about blue roses, that the poison of the blue rose could drive a person mad, and that anyone who came to Renock Island during a blue rose bloom would die. The boy was surprised that she had not heard this terrible legend about the island before, but reassured her that it was just a superstition. The girl wondered if it was a superstition like the one that you could die if you slept in a closed room with the fan on, or that she could be dragged away by a ghost if you wrote your name in red ink. Even though they were so beautiful, there were terrible rumors about them because twice there were found the corpses of people who died suddenly. Letitia had a feeling of uneasiness at these words. But the boy told her that the roses had turned blue because their color had been changed by crystals buried not far from here in the ground. Until they were discovered, they were believed to contain poison that made people go crazy, but there was no poison. Jade had been approached by the guys from his academy, noting that they hadn't seen each other in quite a while and wondering what he was up to. Jade wasn't too happy about it, but he answered and said that the island would be deserted today, so he and his sister had come to admire the flowers. All eyes immediately shifted to the girl, who didn't know that Jade had a sister. Perhaps in the alley where Letitia used to live, she had often seen bad rich men, so she was still afraid of young aristocrats, 
but she thought that if Jade introduced her, she should say a polite hello. Jade wished them a good day and was about to leave, but one of the boys stopped him and asked him to give them a chance to at least say hello to the young lady. He then pulled Letitia forward, and she introduced herself, and each of the guys started to introduce themselves to the girl by name. One of the boys even wanted to kiss her hand, saying she was very nice. But Jade snatched it away saying that the girl was very afraid of strangers, but that she must not be touched, or they would get into trouble, which he would personally arrange. They went to lunch, the girl eating a sandwich with everything she liked. Jade wasn't happy, because he'd decided to spend some time with his sister, and it was such a coincidence that he'd hoped they'd have a cup of tea and leave. But in fact, he knew that instead of lessons, they had come there to test their courage, for they were afraid to come because they feared the curse of the blue rose. Letitia looked at one fellow who appeared very familiar to her, but it was strange, for she did not know any aristocrats. But after talking for a while, the girl realized that they just looked so good-natured, and she probably just thought she had seen them somewhere. At the same time, the boys were discussing that one of them was too modest, which was his flaw. Also, as a child he was more shy and couldn't even talk properly. But over time, he became like a different person, because his friendship with the boys had changed him. They turned to Letitia and said that when she makes her debut in society, let her come to the ball at his house. The girl felt as if she were being treated not as a child, but as a lady of high society. But Jade answered instead, saying that she was too young to make her debut and that it would be up to her and her father to decide where she should go first. He explained that when Letitia grew up, she would always be able to choose safe places to go, and he didn't like the way the boys talked about his sister. They were surprised because Jade was not like himself, and it was the first time they had seen him like this, as he had always been arrogant and cold, which meant that he behaved differently with his family. One of the boys got together and said he was going to go and look at the roses and would like to pick some roses for his sister. She liked them a lot. When they offered to go with him, he said he was not so foolish as to take these legends of the blue rose too seriously and said he would be back soon, for a man cannot really die from the smell of roses. The boys explained to Letitia that the boy's sister had left this world last year when he said he wanted to pick flowers for his sister. It meant that he wanted to put flowers on her grave. Ryan's sister Eliza was a famous beauty, and she was also engaged to their friend, and they got engaged when they were the same age as Letitia. Eliza grew up in the countryside so they rarely saw each other, but she was very good. And the thing is, she died of pneumonia. Ryan had come back to them and had heard their conversation, and said that he had come here today for Eliza's sake, because she had said that she would like to see the blue roses just once, but he didn't want to tell such sad stories. Yesterday he accidentally found his sister's things. There were a lot of blue items, because she loved this color. He was grateful to his friend for the fact that he remembered Lisa still not engaged to anyone else. The boy asked him not to say so, because their family had nothing but money. And Lisa was an outstanding girl from an illustrious family. It was his first love, which meant a lot to him. Although it was very sad for Letitia, but she realized that the friendship of these three looked very worthy. Ryan decided to talk about life in the capital, because there were so many good places there. And since he grew up in the countryside, the capital is a miracle to him. It was a completely different world, and he still remembered how he felt on his first day at the academy. He remembered the red tiles in the evening sun, the excitement when he first got off the train, the sound of the bell from the blue clock tower, and the white doves. Letitia realized that her first lane in the capital was certainly different, but she also loved the blue clock tower at the station. The girl liked the island very much. She was glad that they had come there, but she was a little sleepy and asked to be woken up and not to be left alone. Her new life still seemed like a dream, and she was afraid that it would disappear because of one stupid mistake. What if it was her last meeting with Jade and she would have to live on the streets again? When she woke up after a while, she tried to figure out how long she'd been asleep, but she saw Prince rushing toward her. He grabbed her in his arms and explained that he had come to check on her because she had been so upset that morning. Letitia supposed that he had come to see her on the pretext of going on a boat ride with those women, but the prince never made up any pretexts, and only Letitia could make him drop everything and come. He turned to Jade and asked who were those people who dared to be around his daughter without a chaperone and who were drinking alcohol in the presence of a little girl. 
They apologized, saying they were just having a cup of tea and had done nothing to offend the young lady. But Jade explained that they were seniors from his academy and had met by chance. Jade asked why he had come so early, as the government meetings last for quite a long time. Was it a feeling of jealousy that his brother and sister had decided to spend time together? The prince answered that his majesty had not been working so hard lately, and that was probably why he had finished early, but he was not sure that finishing early was the emperor's wish. The boys turned to the prince and said that they were very interested in his magic, and they even planned to choose that as the topic of their thesis, and also wanted to hear about the times when Cullen had been on the student council. After a while, Ryan said that he needed to step back and call the servants, for they had agreed that he would signal them to the mirrors from the shore. But Letitia suddenly heard some strange sounds coming from the water. The boys were worried about Fursi, who had been away for some time and was still missing. They assumed that he was very drunk and wanted to go after him, because when he drinks he has strong mood swings, so they were worried. Letitia remembered that the prince had not seen the blue roses and offered to look at them before returning home, for she wanted to show him these beautiful flowers. But when they got there, Letitia noticed that everyone's faces had changed, and before her eyes were closed, she saw Fursi lying in the bushes. The prince told the girl to move to the other side, count to three, and walk another ten paces and click. Call the rest of the guys and don't look there while they examine the body. The girl did as he said, but ran to the guys screaming that there was trouble. When the guys came running to the roses, they were told that judging by the wounded wrists and the knife lying nearby, it looked like suicide. The guys couldn't believe that Fursi had killed himself, because it couldn't be, as he had his whole life ahead of him. But they had been together all this time, and there was no one else on the island, because the shore where the boat could dock was only on the other side of the island. Ryan lowered his head and said that it was all because of him, because he had started to talk about his sister, and since it was not easy for Fursi to do so, he only pushed him. It was an impulsive suicide. Letitia realized that such a thing was possible, but she did not know why today, exactly one year after the death of her fiancé, because he had even joked about Elise. She'd seen the dead so many times she wasn't afraid. But the story she'd read in the book was long over and she really didn't know anything. One of the boys, though he didn't want to offend the prince, said that he and his family had found the body of Fursi, and before the three of them decided to go for a little walk, they were all together. The prince smiled and said that they shouldn't be suspected of plotting against Fursi and calling him out, even though there were rumors in the family. But if you look at the amount of blood and the hardened clots, it's clear that the death was at least 30 minutes ago, and he turned to Ryan, saying that it was at the moment when the guy went to the river to give a sign to Fursi and died. It all looks like a perfect suicide in principle. You could say that everyone here is innocent. Although Kaylin and not a doctor and not a detective, and the police will come and deal with it themselves. Laetitia had a strange feeling that they had missed something, as if it was not a suicide and she was sure of it. Looking at the girl, the prince thought she didn't feel well, and he put his hand to her forehead, which again caused the girl to have visions. Someone's memories began to appear in front of the girl's eyes. They were guys walking with Eliza in the park. The prince, looking at her condition, thought that she was very frightened and asked her to be patient for a while because they would meet the policeman and go back. But the girl was surprised that she had a vision with her eyes open. The prince was sure that it was murder, but there was something strange, and he supposed that if there was someone else on the island besides them, but the boat could only dock in one place, and as it was quiet, they would hear splashes. Letitia realized that there were only two possibilities. Either someone had been hiding on the island from the beginning, or the culprit was among them, and she did not know which was more likely. She realized that if her guess was correct, then the culprit had made a mistake, and the one who had killed in the version would die by Kaylin's hand. Ryan said that the guy had a great future ahead of him, and he had cut off his life by slitting his veins, and since he was an excellent swordsman, he was able to cut both veins and arteries. The police had already arrived on the island, and the inspector noticed that there had been a lot of strange things going on around the prince lately. But this town was strange in itself. After the interrogation was over, the inspector gave them permission to go home, and the prince took the girl by the hand and said that it was time to go. Letitia came to the prince and said that she felt sorry for Ryan, 
for when she heard the story of his dead sister, she felt very sad and asked if they could take him home. She would have liked to comfort him on the way, but his sister's fiance had died and he must feel bad. And if they were left alone, they would probably blame each other for the death, which made her sad. So Jade went over to Ryan and pushed him, saying that if their girl wanted to go, there was nothing to be done and suggesting that maybe this was a way to save Ryan, since at least it was better than being alone with Jax. Though Ryan denied that he could have gone home on his own, the prince urged him to get into the carriage, saying that if his daughter wanted to do what she wanted, he could not let the boy down. Sitting in the carriage, Letitia thought about the fact that today, Ryan killed Fursi with a very simple trap, but she did not understand why he used this method to kill him. She was curious about that. If her guesses about that reason were correct, she would want to tell Cullen about it, or she would be uneasy. Cullen is a fair man, but he won't listen to everyone's personal stories. That's what the book is about. She doesn't know how it all ended, and the content of the novel was quite sad. In the book, Cullen was not a happy man. According to her calculations, they should have arrived by now. And looking out the window, she realized that this was the right place. So she turned to the prince and asked him to stop, because in the window fell out the bow on Mishka, which from the morning tied Maria. Ryan, seeing that they had stopped, lowered his head and said that he would go out here, though it was quite a deserted place, but he did not want to inconvenience them anymore. Letitia realized that there was a reason why he had to go out in this alley. So she turned to the boy and said that she wanted to ask him something. She looked at the guy and asked him if they had met before, and if they had met before, who he was, because she had met Leon before. She asked what color the clock tower at the station was, and the boy, puzzled, said that it was gold, which was true, because the tallest clock tower at the station was bright gold. However, when they were on the island and he said differently, on the island he said that it was blue, but he was not mistaken at all, because it was blue too. Although his mistake made it easier for her to solve the puzzle, the clock tower at the station is painted with a special paint. So it is gold in color during the day and blue at night. Usually street kids use it as a meeting place, saying meet me at the blue tower means they want to meet at night. Once her friends invited her to see the trains during the day, so they secretly entered the station. Even though normal people don't go to the station at night, all trains in the kingdom stop running at 6 p.m. and the station is closed at night. The only people the tower serves as a meeting place for are the guys from the lower village, mostly pickpockets. And once she saw Orion at night in the station and was born in the same place he was, she'd assumed he was from Lower Township and she'd been worried about what had happened today. But as far as she could remember, he'd talked about being born in the village. The boy was silent at first and could not answer, but suddenly he grabbed the girl and pulled her out of the carriage, holding a knife to her throat and asking her not to move. As the girl assumed they were twins, for the guy who was holding her had asked to let Ryan out of the carriage, and she realized something was a vision and was a memory of Orion. At first she thought it was a hallucination and she was seeing two Orions, but it wasn't. They were twins. The prince asked him to let his daughter go, and if he did he would kill him without pain, but the guy asked to let Ryan go, or he would do something very bad. The prince, with the help of his magic, pushed him away and approached his daughter, asking, did he really think that if he threatened to hurt his daughter, he would just stand there and watch? He then approached the boy promising to kill him in the most painful way. At the same time, Jade presented a knife to Ryan's mount, saying he would kill him too. However, Letitia shouted loudly, asking them all to stop. The prince did not agree, but immediately rushed towards the guy saying that since he dared to threaten his daughter with the knife, he would cut off both his hands first. But the girl realized that it was the same as killing him, because if he cut off both his hands, the guy would die, and tried to convince the prince that he did not even hurt her. The prince wasn't a fan of listening to murderers' stories, but if the daughter asked for it, there was nothing to be done. The prince began to ask, since when exactly the twins began to change with each other, which of them killed Fursi and how Letitia knew about it. But the girl was confused and said that it was not the most important thing now, because it was more important to find out how the murder happened, and the prince realized that his daughter had a talent for manipulation. The prince said he would let Ryan talk, but if he didn't say anything, he would torture his brother until he died. Jade said that when her father said such words, he should cover Letitia's ears, 
but it was too late and she had heard everything, so they decided to start the interrogation as his daughter wanted. The murder of Fursi turned out to be just as Letitia had expected. When Ryan went to pluck roses he was replaced by his brother Raiden, and while one was talking to them, and he, who was hiding in the bushes, killed Fursi and disguised the whole thing as a suicide, and then he sent a sign with a mirror, and they switched places again. It was a simple switch trap, and Fursi died without even screaming, for he covered his mouth with a handkerchief soaked in the potion and rendered him unconscious for a time. I untold how easy it was to lure Fursi, because he always gave only blue-colored objects, and talking about these objects managed to hurt his memories, and he did not regret anything, because that scoundrel Fursi mocked Eliza. His twin brother, Redden, had to be taken into foster care, and was soon bankrupted on the street. Ryan was very surprised to hear that Letitia grew up on the streets too, and maybe that's when she saw him. He met him when they were just over 10 years old. All this time, they had been changing places and attending classes at the academy, because they were very similar in appearance. So Ryan wanted to give his brother back the life of an aristocrat. They had been training for a long time to look like the same person, and then Jade realized why sometimes the guy seemed like someone else, and asked him why he had killed Fursi. He told her that he had driven Elise to her death, his sister was very beautiful, and every year she became even more beautiful. There were even those who offered money just so she would break off her engagement to Fursi and accept a proposal of marriage, and the boy found out about it. But Letitia realized that this was not all, and he said that she was a very mysterious person and suggested that there was someone else living in that little body, for she was right, and it did not end there. One day, Fursi was in a country house, and he got drunk and did something to Eliza, for when he drinks he becomes a very different person. The thing is, that in that mansion was not only Fursi, but also a few, not quite decent young men. They began to incite the guy he got drunk and passed out. And then something happened. When aristocratic circles say that an unmarried or unmarried person died of pneumonia in most cases, they mean suicide. Before her death, Eliza told her brothers about everything, and then she slit her wrists and they wanted to kill Fursi in the same way. Even though one of them didn't even grow up with a sister, they only had one week and one day all three of them lived together in their estate. It was the only happy time Ryan still remembered it, as if it was yesterday. Letitia, on the other hand, realized that it was the exact same memory she had seen. Ryan said that he had committed the crime and the prince could use him for black magic experiments, but the only thing he asked was to let Redden go. Ryan was curious about something and asked how Letitia knew that he and his brother had agreed to meet at this very spot, after which the girl noticed that Cullen and Jade's gazes were searing her. She explained that they'd been with them the whole time Fursi had been gone. And if this was really a murder, it meant that there was someone else on the island besides them. But since the cops searched the island and found no one, it turns out that someone got away before the cops arrived. There's a bridge on the opposite side of the island from where they got on the boat, which is pretty close and can be reached by swimming. And under it is a hole leading to an underground road. And it just so happens that the place where they were now was the exit from this tunnel. For all the boys from the shutters know about this secret way. And it was from this little clue that the girl drew such a strong conclusion. Letitia said that if Mr. Ryan had heard of the night watchtower, he might have heard of this tunnel too. And when she was called clever, she thought it was because of the detective novels she had read so much in her former life. All the more she was curious as to the reason for the murder of her dead younger sister's fiancé, and wondered what Cullen intended to do now. The prince's intuition told him that Fursi had killed someone, which was why he was going to investigate Jax and Ryan to determine the real culprit, and then wanted to go to him personally. Jade said he sympathized with the boys, because he was an older brother now too, and if anyone dared touch his little sister, he didn't want to imagine what would happen. But right now, he was ready to kill one of these guys just to vent his anger. But in general, it turned out that this time, everything could be forgiven. After that, the prince asked what Letitia thought about it and offered her to decide, because maybe she wanted to take his side. The man said that if so, he would not want to let him live, for he was not the kind of father who was broad-minded. In which case, Jade was also ready to vote to kill them. The girl assumed it was psychology, not taking sides but mine, and realized that if she hadn't had that vision yet, 
she would have felt sorry for the dead girl. Even though she'd never met Eliza, she was sorry, and she wished the princess hadn't regretted her actions. She knows what kind of man Cullen is. He's the dark hero hunting criminals, the sad character in this novel. He has no pity for the criminals, but she'd like him to make a decision this time after hearing their story. Letitia would not want him to make a mistake because Ryan and Redden are different from the criminals he has killed so far. The prince agreed with her statement and thanked her, for if not for her assistance, he would have missed a very important fact. The prince leaned toward Ryan and asked if he remembered the names of the bad friends of Fursi who had been at the country house that day. But he answered himself that of course he remembered them, for such things cannot be forgotten even in a dream, and asked to be introduced to them. He promised that if he told their names, he would let the brothers go. But it was all thanks to his daughter. He asked as if he wanted to meet good people. Jade approached Ryan and said that next time they could even say hello when they met, because he was starting to like him, but only if he dared to say hello to Letitia, and he would kill him. She said he was fine, but he killed his sister's enemy too easily. If he were Ryan, Jade would have made him suffer and killed him slowly. The prince said that the worst part was when you cleaned up one and there was a lot of garbage left behind, but he was an expert at cleaning up garbage, and if someone did something wrong, they had to be punished for it. That was Cullen's rule. Cullen absorbs magical powers from human bodies, and those who feed on magical powers are called eaters. There are only three ways that Cullen can absorb an eater. The first is if it is a murderer, the second is someone who has recently died, and the third is the one who dared to touch an innocent girl. It is a crime even more serious than murder. As a result, for Cullen murderers, rapist on the same level, the boys were overjoyed and couldn't believe they were alive. They were released. However, the prince said that they had to remember that those who once tasted blood will not be the same, and he will leave his mark on them in case they do something else, he will come for them. He picked up Letitia in his arms, suddenly remembering and turning to the boys to thank them for the treat because the moment they found Fursi, it was still a fresh corpse. Cullen's second rule about eating the eater, which was why he'd told the girl to stay away. Jade thought about the fact that Fursi had been so mean, but it still made him feel a little bad that his father had consumed someone he knew. The prince already liked scavenging and thought that he had a lot of fun adventures ahead of him if he followed his daughter. The prince also said that now he knew who Letitia was, he thought she was a genius, because if an accident happens twice, it is an inevitability, Jay agreed. Indeed it is. It is very surprising that being uneducated was so clever and asked if she could memorize words that she had seen once or any unknown figures. The girl was surprised and if she was so smart, would she have lived on the street? So she simply replied that she was really just an ordinary child. Cullen wanted to check her out. He knew doctors who had examined Jade when she was a child who could see if she had powers. Letitia was worried that if they examined her, they would realize that she was no genius and hoped that the prince wouldn't give up on her. After they returned to the house, they were met by Sion, who noticed that they were late and the lady looked tired. But the prince proudly said that a lot of things had happened, but the most important thing was that his daughter was a genius. In the evening, finally coming into the room, the girl lay on the bed realizing how tired she was because she didn't even expect that her father would talk about her during the whole dinner. Jay came into her room to see if she was all right, for she looked so sad as they drove past the intersection. The girl explained that she lived in the alley behind the crossroads, and every time she drove by, she remembered how cold it was, and she probably did. And as soon as she thought about it, she was cold. She also thought about her friends, but there was really no need to worry, because they had a rule that they forgot about each other. After Jade left, the girl remembered that she had a vision when Cullen touched her. It was different from what she had read about in the book from her past life. She didn't understand what it was because she didn't know when or why the memories were coming, and most importantly, she didn't know how to feel about it. After that, for a few days, Cullen did not even stutter about the fact that the girl was a genius, because Letitia decided that he had completely forgotten about it. One day, Cullen suggested that she go somewhere and suggested the cafe that Maria had told him about, because it was the last time Letitia liked it very much, and he had some business nearby. The girl was very happy that they would go to the cafe at once, and rushed to the room, saying that she would quickly collect the food and they would go, still asked her not to run, and ordered the servants to take care of her. But the girl stopped confused, 
and said that she was in a hurry and had forgotten about it. When they got ready, Cullen looked at the girl and complimented her, saying that she was very pretty and sweet. Letitia asked to take his hand and did not expect such a reaction, because the man hugged her and said that she just drove him crazy. However, when she took his hand, it was just as she thought, because there were absolutely no visions as last time. After the incidents on Rennick Island, Letitia had tried to grab Cullen's hand every chance she got, but absolutely nothing happened, just as it did now. She couldn't figure out what it was about the ability and why it was manifesting itself so unexpectedly. However, when she got out of the carriage, she read the sign that said that this was Dr. Sybil's laboratory, where Cullen wanted to try to conduct one short test. The girl remembered the genius test that he was talking about and realized that he said that they would go to a cafe, but I was deceived, remembering exactly the same events from her past life when they tried to force her to go to the dentist. At the threshold, they were met by a man, greeted them, and showed them where to go. Letitia was surprised that this man was a doctor, because he looked very young. The prince said that he had some business to attend to, but there would be a guard outside, and for any unnecessary movement towards his daughter, the doctor would be in big trouble, so he had to treat her with special care. The girl could not believe that he was leaving her here alone, but the prince said that he would be away for a while on business, and she just needed to talk to this man. Having got acquainted with the girl, the doctor smiled, because in his opinion she was very nice and looked like a puppy that had lost its master. The girl looked at him carefully and was surprised that he was a doctor, because she thought that all doctors had gray hair and were old, but the guy had only recently reached adulthood. Other people called such as him geniuses, for few at such a young age could get a degree. And the prince had brought the girl here to see if she too was a genius, for such as Sybil could help her. The girl thanked him for his kindness, but said that she did not need help, because she was sure that she was not a genius. Sybil asked her not to worry, for this sometimes happened in aristocratic families, when foolish parents thought their children were intoxicated and led to it. He couldn't get enough of how cute the girl was, and Letitia wondered how he could be so arrogant and call Kaylin stupid. The doctor explained that sometimes there are parents who are very upset because they believe in the genius of their theater, but such are the usual means of those who want to profit by using their children to be certainly not like the prince. And if she really is a genius, she would need his help. However, Letitia focused her attention on the word upset and knew that she was not a genius without realizing whether it was necessary to do this test if she did not want to. Sybil had already been told that the girl didn't know all the letters yet, so he decided to use the beads, and she had to solve the problem he would give her. And then Dr. Sybil began to tell Letitia all sorts of amazing things. He began to show her complicated labyrinths and numbers, and asked about the connection between the ending and the ending in a story. The girl answered some questions, and some she did not know the answer to. If you think about it, then she did not learn anything in that life, not in this life, and died in childhood. Therefore, she could not go to school. But on the other hand, his riddles were quite interesting. And so about two hours passed. The doctor had to summarize the results of the test, and Letitia had to wait. The girl was sure that she was not a genius, because geniuses usually remember you at first sight invent amazing things, can learn 10-digit numbers and make calculations in their heads. Are there really parents who think their children are geniuses and then are disappointed in them? Or perhaps the Kalen hoped that Letitia would help him in his work and worried that if she proved useless, he would be disappointed in her. She hoped that in that case, he wouldn't kick her out. And even if he didn't, he might start harassing and bullying her and she didn't know what to do. These thoughts only made her sad and the results should not come today. The prince came into the study and noticed the upset girl and asked what had happened and whether someone had offended her. Letitia cried and apologized to him, saying that she was not a genius. Under his perplexed gaze, she told him that today the doctor had asked her questions and that she had not answered any of the three main questions and that she had a perfectly ordinary memory. In which case, she would not be able to help him. The girl said that if it turned out that she was not a genius, and she thought that the prince would be disappointed in her. At the same moment, Cullen realized how kind she was, and not for nothing they say that daughters make fathers' hearts beat harder. It was really true. He didn't expect anything from her. He was just worried. 
because as she knew their lineage often produced people with outstanding mental abilities, and it wasn't surprising that he or Jade had skipped grades and gotten degrees early on. After these words, the girl was even more upset, for she was different from them because she was not their own daughter. Kaylin didn't mean that at all, and explained that sometimes geniuses were born, but usually they committed suicide or became depressed, because it was a great misfortune to have outstanding mental abilities that couldn't be handled. Jade was also sickly and weak as a child, though not to that extent, so Cullen thought it would be better to be prepared in advance if the girl turned out to be a genius. Though it might seem to Letitia that the prince was expecting something, he couldn't help but be pleased with her, because any parent would be happy with such a sweet and clever girl. She didn't have to be clever, she could be a fool. The prince explained that it was not necessary for her to do something. After all, her task was to spend his money, as he could provide her with absolutely everything in it, and there was a sense of becoming his daughter. After that, the prince said that they would go to a cafe, because he promised and would buy the girl absolutely everything she wanted. So he reassured her, saying that any result would be good for him. So they had to wait for the doctor, with whom he would talk, after which they would go. After that, Sybil came out to them, scanty documents saying that the results were already ready, but their conversation would turn out to be a little long. But the prince asked him to tell him briefly, for his daughter had time for a snack. Whereupon, Sybil explained that the young lady was not a genius who required any special treatment, but in some areas, she clearly possessed unusual abilities. With such abilities, she could be called gifted, for the young lady had an extraordinary ability for language. She was good at expressing her thoughts, given her level of education. She also had a predisposition for reasoning, good situational awareness and reactions, she memorizes things faster than normal people, and shockingly even more she never learned to count, but she has a concept of numbers. From all this, it could be concluded that the young lady has very sharp abilities, and the girl will need to learn a lot. The prince was pleased because he already knew that his daughter possessed, after all, a gifted person. And there is a genius, and she was also very nice. And though she said that she could be a fool, but smart and rich people to live much more interesting and thought that the girl needed as soon as possible to master writing, and in general, a lot to learn. Taking the girl by the hand, he led her to the exit saying that it was time to go eat chocolate cake. But they were stopped by the doctor who said that he had one more consultation with the young lady. The prince already seemed to have talked to his daughter long enough. Yet Letitia asked him to listen, for the doctor said there was still some part left, this consultation he had to do inside. He couldn't talk to her outside. For a frank and confidential conversation, the counseling would have to take place unaccompanied by a guardian. Though Cullen glared at the doctor with a very displeased look, Letitia agreed to go to the consultation, hoping that the doctor would not dare to harm her. They went into one of the rooms, which turned out to be the doctor's personal laboratory, where he was researching different areas of the facility. To be honest, there is a special educational course for such gifted people as Letitia, but since the prince was very dear to her, he probably will not allow to conduct this course because it is organized by a special institution that is quite far away. The man explained that this room was the last test and offered her to try to solve the last problem just for the sake of interest, because it is hidden inside this room and it must be found. The girl looked around the room, saw a brown desk, a chair for visitors' identical bookcases, and noticed that the layout of the previous office of this room was clearly the same. And if one were to remove the papers and instruments from here, they would most likely look exactly identical and realized that this was a search for differences. And if a clear difference had to be found, she realized it was the painting hanging on the wall. She realized that both depicted a forest landscape, but the previous painting depicted a crossroads of forest paths, while this one had a round fence and flowers along it. The girl noticed that there were paths in the form of a cross and a circle, so she asked the doctor if there was a book in the cupboard with the words cross and circle in the title, for she was not very well read and could not find it herself. Siebel said that gifted people were different because she could follow the riddle so easily, considering that she was not very well read, because the title of the book was indeed cross and circle. The girl realized that this book could be the right answer but it seemed to her that everything was not so simple. There was another sign in the place where the book stood, 
and it was felt that this circle was specially drawn by someone. The girl came to the conclusion that she had two circles and one cross, and therefore she had to add these two circles to look like a snake biting itself by the tail. And this is a sign of infinity. Then she asked if there was a book with the name infinity. The guy took out such a book saying that the cross and the circle was also the right answer. But he didn't think that she would guess it. He had a few more riddles, but he assumed that the prince's patience was nearing its limit, so he said to end it there. The guy also said that on the back of the card she found was the address of the lab, because gifted kids like her get more and more aware of their difference from other people as they get older. And he was the same way when he was a kid. He is a teacher of such gifted children and their helpers. If Letitia feels that she does not know where to go and how to go on, she had to come to him, and the laboratory was always open. He also added that the prince did not have high hopes for her, but rather was just proud of her abilities, though the girl was surprised at how he knew what she thought of it, but concluded that that was why Cullen was so excited, because he was simply proud of her rather than afraid of being disappointed. The prince thought the time of their conversation had already dragged on and went into the lab saying that Sybil was more of a comedian than a doctor. He was also approached by Letitia, who said that the doctor had told her that he was very proud of her and said that she was also proud of the prince and it would be great if he continued to do so. When they left, the lad realized that as he had heard, the girl was contentedly interesting and was very close to the right answer. As it was not in the praise card, but specifically in the box with the red flower. However, the next questions were not to be forgotten, for another riddle was the question, where is the real Dr. Sybil? Since all the girl's answers were correct, but she could not find the right one, it was already a problem of imagination, and suggested that perhaps it would develop when there was more cruelty in her life. So he said goodnight to the real Dr. Sybil, realizing that he would need his name in the near future, since it had been quite useful so far. He finally learned that the girl's name was Letitia, realizing that she would make a great woman and was looking forward to it. Among the aristocrats, there were already rumors that Fursi could not forget his fiancée and in this regard committed suicide. One of the guys who heard this smiled and thought him a fool, because for money, you can meet as many women as you want without realizing what was so special about that poor woman. But it was even better for him, because if it became known that they had a hand in his fiancée, they would be in trouble. He was about to enter the carriage, but not before he was seized by the prince, who said a friend had told him about him. That's why he had come. It was Hansel de Dedeit, a pervert who killed a woman for money. He was also responsible for an untold number of assaults on girls, 15 other similar cases that are unconfirmed. The prince was really happy because such a scum like him is a real gift for him. And despite the fact that he was still alive, could not utter a single word, so the prince suggested to start the meal, because not for nothing they say that it is better to eat when a person is still alive. He realized that he had seen him somewhere, but he did not know why his tongue did not move. He warned him that it would be a little painful, because since he lived as a dirty animal, he was supposed to die as an animal. He had a daughter now too, so he decided to hunt bastards like him first and introduced himself saying his name was Cullen and he needed to memorize the name of the man who would kill him as it was a favor. Also, a little later, I was going to play with his friends and he was going to kill him right now, and he was going to be thanked for it by the version. This was just as Letitia, and was taking the test, and having finished, he hurried off so as not to leave her there alone. When they were in the cafe, the prince wanted to order all the cakes that were there, but the girl said that she could not eat them all, she had only one chocolate cake. It was strange for the prince, because she noticed that at such times, Letitia has a very stern expression on her face. Also, the girl said that today she worked hard with her head and asked for this cake. Then the prince smiled and asked the waitress to bring absolutely all the chocolate desserts and wished the girl a pleasant appetite and told her to eat quickly. Letitia asked where the prince had gone while waiting for her from the test because he looked very satisfied and also tied his tie differently, noting that it was not tied by Sion although he usually knows how to tie ties and handkerchiefs. The prince remembered that he had tidied his clothes after it was all over. I realized that she was very observant. Not only was she so nice, but she had a great memory. The girl asked if she could meet him, but Cullen replied that it was impossible to see him because he was not such a close friend, and it was surprising to the investment 
that there were such different relationships between adults. Looking through the window, the prince noticed a group of people that apparently found Hansel's corpse. The discovery of a corpse is a common thing. Surely it will be recorded as deceased for unknown reasons, and he would only benefit from the low arrest rates in the kingdom. Still, there was no time to be bored in the capital and Cullen liked that. Plus, he had a new joy of life to think about as he was very fond of the girl. She had a cute appearance, mysterious character, intelligence, just a little suspiciousness he asked to remain forever the same as today. Since the girl didn't understand what was special about today, he simply said that she was lovely by her mere existence. And though she was embarrassed, it didn't matter if his words made her happy. The man wondered when she would start calling him daddy, because today was perfect in every way except for this small detail. After a while, they finished and left the cafe, where they saw a carriage with Scion and Jade waiting in it, the girl wondering what kind of a magical day it was. As they drove along, the girl suddenly felt cold. But when she looked out the window, she realized that they were passing through that alley. And that was why she was suddenly cold. However, she was very surprised to get out, because she realized that the street she lived in had changed dramatically and she could not recognize it. It had changed that house near which they had gutted the garbage can, and the owners of the house had pretended as if nothing had happened, and that warehouse where they sat in the cold winters in the same place each other had. Looking around, yes, and in the middle of the street, she realized that it was all gone, and there stood the big house with a sign outside that said it was a house for Lee's friends. She looked up on her toes and looked through one of the windows and noticed that there was even a fireplace and it was very cozy and warm and not understanding, and looked at the guys asking what it was. The prince explained that it was her and Jade's joint creation, for she was very worried about her companions. They wanted to do something special for her, and every time they passed this street fly, everyone always had a very sad look on their faces. So Jade began to think of something to do to make her not frown, for she was still a child, and sometimes adults know children better than they know themselves for Letitia wanted to break the promise she had made to her friends. The prince explained that he had bought all the houses on the street and had paid the owners generously, which they were very happy about. Then he had combined all the buildings and created one big house, in which only children could enter and warm themselves there at any time in the winter. The girl thanked him, but the prince thought it was not necessary to thank him, because he was his father, which meant that he wanted her to call him daddy. Until now, Letitia couldn't call him daddy because she was afraid that one day she would have to leave this family and she was afraid that she would expect too much from her own father. But now, everything changed. She threw her arms around him, thanking them for everything they had done. She was happier than ever. She had never imagined she would ever be happy in this world. They might be a little strange, but that was okay because she wanted them to be her family. Jade said that she could have been Lee or Letitia. It didn't matter. And she should just throw away all the sad memories of that street, because part of her name had become this house and could keep the children warm. Jade added that he had tried to find a boy named Walter, but had been unable to, for he had been told that he had left town recently, and Letitia had assumed that he had gone to work or to Lower Township. In response to Jade's suggestion that she find him, the girl said that she didn't have to worry about him, because he would find a place anywhere. That day, Walter should have died at the hands of a murderer, but his fate had changed, and Letitia hoped that he too would live in better conditions. That day, Lay's house appeared, and her personal winter came to an end. In the newspapers, it was written that the murder of teenagers continues. For unknown reasons, Cantel de Ruble was one of the guys who abused Eliza, and it was the third murder after Hansel so the twins assumed that it was the work of the prince. They also noticed that the doctor was very much like the prince, for it seemed to them that they were of the same mind, and it seemed to them that they could do something unusual without blinking an eye. One of them wondered how Letitia was doing, but the other brother asked him not to speak of her, for he had even gone to the prince's house and left a flower there, though he did not know whether she had found it but she had saved their lives and he often remembered her. But they realized that perhaps they should have told her about the doctor, for it was he who had suggested to them the method of killing Fertzi, for he was the man who planned such things. One day, when Ryan was sitting in the park near the academy, 
Dr. Sybil came up to him and looked at Fertzi and said that he knew that this guy had driven his sister to suicide and offered his help in killing him. To realize the plan of murder that developed Dr. Siebel was quite easy, but the prince's family and Letitia interfered in the matter. After the failure of Ryan and Reedon, nothing remained but to tell the doctor that a girl named Letitia guessed their involvement in the murder. And about the fact that the prince let them go, the doctor without any explanation sent them to deliver the flower. But he and Ridden, instead of the red flower, left there a blue rose. As a sign of respect of apology and gratitude to Letitia, they had violated the doctor's words by not delivering the red flower, and they knew that they wanted to warn the girl that the doctor knew about her. But they were the ones who had told the doctor about Letitia, and if the prince found out about it, he would kill them. So they made up their minds to leave the town as if nothing had happened, and ran to the last train, but immediately froze when they saw the doctor in the midst of the crowd. The next moment Sibyl was beside them, grabbing one of the boys by the arm, for he was sad that they were leaving without even saying goodbye to him, which was not very nice and respectful to the doctor. The boys, on the other hand, put their heads down and said that they had not contacted him as there was no opportunity and asked him to forgive him. However, the doctor said that there was nothing wrong with it, and as it turned out, Miss Letitia was insanely clever, and in his opinion, it was indeed fate. He explained that he had recently opened a laboratory and that the girl Letitia, whom the boys had told him about, had come there, and he wanted to meet her, and he was very pleased because she had great hopes for a great future. When the boys asked him if he had done anything wrong, the doctor said he couldn't do anything wrong because it was the perfect candidate to take care of what he wanted to get. After talking to her, he concluded that she was quite simple, but very clever and beautiful. But then he stopped talking and went on to say that he had not told the boys about the damages because they had some kind of agreement. The doctor promised that he would not receive a penny of payment for the murders of this scum in the version of the doctor. But in return, he had the conditions to commit the perfect crime and not to be caught by the police and then to leave a red flower at the scene of the crime. But they not only failed the whole plan, but also violated his last instructions. Despite the guy's excuses, he said that he had repeatedly said that his condition was always the perfect crime. Even though they had achieved the goal and killed him, it would all be meaningless if they were caught. And since they had been caught by the prince, it was time to make amends. However, the brothers stood up for each other and said that they were late for the train because they were going to the West and heard that there were many jobs there. But the doctor was already strange, because holding the tickets in his hand there was written something completely different, and apparently they were heading north to the province of September. Suddenly people started rushing around the station, and there was an explosion. One of the trains exploded and everyone had to leave the station immediately in order not to get hurt and to save their lives. The twins asked the doctor to return her tickets, but having taken the tickets out of the guy's hands, they started to disappear, as the doctor decided that the dress would be their life and said goodbye, and as he had fun together with them to kill the scum of unnecessary society. And he was also very grateful that they had introduced him to Letitia and could not be bothered since the doctor was going to give her the full attention and love she deserved. The twins realized that it was the same spell that the prince had used on them and the doctor left saying that in deference to the grand revenge, he would send them to the other world without pain. The commotion caused by the explosion of the train made the headlines of the capital's newspapers. For unknown reasons, there was a fire in the freight compartment where there were no passengers. Although it was quickly extinguished the next day, another important event occurred. Two corpses were found sleeping. They were sitting close together with their heads pressed together like Siamese twins, both bodies were covered with blue roses, as if erupting from them. That's what was written in the article in almost all newspapers. And the paper said that their identities had not yet been established. Jade felt sorry for them, for they had avenged their sister's death and should have just lived happily ever after. But they were not destined to continue living happily ever after. The prince was surprised that Jade believed that a murderer could live a happy life. But he used to be sure of it. But now he didn't even know that he was enjoying life lately, and only thanks to his father. For when he looked at Letitia, 
he was glad he had never looked at her. And he supposed that maybe after a while, he would even realize what it was to be truly happy being at home among his own people. Though Jade was his son, he didn't understand what was going through his mind. But Jade said it was because he was his son. He liked to admire Letitia, and he said that Cullen didn't need to pretend to be interested in him, especially since he didn't like it when he did. Sion tried to cut in, but the prince interrupted him, remembering that they had told him to act like furniture when they talked. And they also asked him to hide this article from Letitia so that she would never see it. For if she knew that such a thing had happened to the twins, she would weep very much. The prince understood that in any case the murder of the twins would soon be forgotten, because in the capital there are often various murders. He was out of mood and he had a feeling that he was challenged. This time there were no red colors, but he kept seeing someone's shadow. He had to kill the twins he'd left alive, and in such an unusual way that he assumed it was a ghost from the past to avenge his death. And though he realized that the prince was probably exaggerating, he told Sion not to let Letitia alone without supervision. If Maria wanted to see her, she should come to his house. Winter came, and the family spent more time at home. Cullen and Jade were still busy, and Sion forbade Letitia to play outside alone. Every now and then she would ask him to play outside for a while, but he would try to justify it by saying it was too cold, and she was already out for a walk. But the girl managed to persuade him, and the maid rushed after her, asking her to put on her coat, though the girl refused because she thought that if she wore another coat, she would look like a snowman. But the others thought that it was better to be a warm snowman than to catch cold in the street. Once her ball rolled outside the fence, the girl went there to retrieve it. However, she found a blue rose and was surprised because the season of blue roses was already over and assumed that Ryan had come there and left her a present. And the girl drew a house because it was her homework. Sion noticed how well she drew a tower with a spire and explained that this building was very expensive to the prince and asked if she wanted to show him the drawing later. But the girl was embarrassed and said that she did not. For her father had said that he was good at drawing and playing musical instruments and she thought that if she showed him such a terrible drawing, he would laugh at her. However, he replied that it was not so, for Cullen was absolutely good at everything she did, and even perfect. Letitia even noticed that Sion sometimes spoke like a prince, and realized that he actually had a lot to do besides entertain her. But the man replied that taking care of them was also an important part of his job, and added that he thought the drawing was very nice. All he was running the house instead of Cullen for Letitia's homework and he probably didn't have time and thought that daddy would scold her since it wasn't his job to play with her. But still, he thought it was the other way around. For if the master and the young master found out that they were alone, that is, that Sion alone was looking after her, they would be angry, for they were both too jealous and attached to those they loved. He also asked if the girl had any homework besides drawing a picture. Letitia answered, that she had to read a book and write a poem on her own. Other tasks she could easily do, but it was very difficult for her to write poems. She had not had the opportunity to do this in her previous life, and she did not understand why only aristocrats studied it, and she was trying to understand what poetry was and what verse writing was. Sion said that he studied poetry, and she didn't have to worry about it too much. If she had a hard time understanding poetry, she just had to describe what she liked. But of course, it was worth it to follow the verse size that her teacher had taught her. The girl thought about what she liked and remembered about the chocolate cake, in response to which he said that it was very good because it would be great to write a poem about a sweet chocolate cake. They had a conversation. The girl asked if Zion had gone to school as a child, but as it turned out, he lived in an orphanage at the temple and he was lucky. Because he was taught by priests, he learned ancient languages literature and even singing. Letitia realized that this knowledge was of a very high level, and she had heard that it was not necessary to study so much to be a butler, and complimented him on how much he knew. The girl still had to read the book. She was glad because she had been told that today she would not have to repeat the table etiquette of greetings, and asked Sion if he had read the story. The man replied that the priests in the temple were not very fond of anything to do with magic, so as a child, he could not read books about wizards. And the girl noticed that at times when their butler talked about life in the temple, he became very sad. 
When Sion asked if he could help her with this task, the girl asked him to think about it and said that she had learned to read aloud. One by one she offered to read the book to him, to which the man was very surprised, and although she was grateful for the offer, but realized that if the young master knew about it, there could be some problems. Letizia looked at him with misunderstanding and wondered if he would be scolded for helping her with her lessons. And when the boy agreed, she explained that it was a story about a good and evil wizard, which was the most famous fairy tale in the kingdom, and the teacher said to read it. This story is about the prince and his family, which is what the teacher said, and one of the wizards in this book is a dark wizard, and as it turns out the story of the good wizard in the legend is the story of the prince's family. In other words, the story of the good wizard. This is the story of the beginning of their family. Long ago in the kingdom lived evil and good wizards. They used crystals were much stronger than modern mages, but there were also greedy and evil wizards who used their power to torment people. Once the inhabitants of the kingdom united to drive them away, they were joined by good wizards, among whom there was a dark wizard who volunteered to lead a group of good wizards, and his name was Levelton. The magicians divided into two camps fought to the last. It was a great and famous war, which is called the War of the Magicians. In the end, with the help of good magicians of the kingdom won, and the evil magicians were completely exterminated. The good magicians hid their abilities, so that ordinary people would not get hurt and use them only for good deeds. The clans of good wizards are still friends of the kingdom, and the evil white mages are dead and now dwell in the cemetery. Sion applauded the girl saying that she was good, because she read very well, and without a hitch, and despite the fact that she knew the story. But after Letitia had read it, he looked at it differently, and thanks to her, he had learned something new for which he thanked her. Letitia had never heard her address praised before, but in this house everything came easily to her, both praise and warm feelings. However, this story seemed very strange to her, for the story was somewhat ruthless and cruel. It turns out that during the war a lot of his wizards died, and from this they made such a story with cute pictures, and for her it was surprising that the story of this fairy tale is real. But all is true because the family of the prince was of the first wizards who began to help ordinary citizens because this clan has great influence. The status of clans is determined depending on who first became on the side of the kingdom of the palace. In most cases it was like that, but the prince's family is a symbolic clan. After all, they still provide the kingdom with various magical skills, such as the right to produce the right to give and import goods. This right belongs to the prince's family, and many people are interested in it so the royal family can't just take it away. After this conversation, Sion was about to leave, because it was time to get ready for dinner. But he was going to go to the kitchen and ask for a chocolate cake as a dessert. The girl was glad of this, and when he left her she thought about going back to her poems. However, to her surprise she fell asleep. She woke up when the prince returned to the house, and lifting her up on his arm, he wondered why his daughter was getting lighter and lighter, and did not know when she would gain weight and grow. Although Letitia thought that she had already put on weight, and every time she visited Maria, her aunt said that she had grown larger. The prince thought it was worth measuring her height, for it seemed to him that she had not grown a bit since she had lived in the house. It was even better for him that she should always remain a little girl, for it was said that the best time was when the chick had not yet flown out of the nest. Then the man went out of her room, saying that since it was soon supper time, the girl would have to change her clothes and go out, and remained waiting outside her room. However, looking around he noticed Sion and asked what had happened, because he had always been like a statue, and now he was living in a completely different way. He explained that he was just going to take the young mistress her assignment, but the prince, realizing that the homeroom teacher had assigned homework, wondered if Sion had secretly peeked at it. The butler started to justify himself saying that it was not so, and he did not do anything secretly because she was just lying on top of him. Then the prince took his hand and asked him to give him the assignment. And after reading her verse, the prince realized that geniuses had other abilities after all, and invited scientists to analyze the verse. And the best part was that Letitia tried to keep the rhyme and rhythm, but at the end, she ruined it with the part about the chocolate cake. However, they assumed that on the last line and simply did not want to do their homework, 
All he asked not to show that they had read about it, but the prince had already discussed that to begin with, it was necessary to put them in a frame or keep them. The prince did not understand how a man could write such a lovely poem and how the handwriting could be so lovely, even fairies could not be so lovely. See and listening to this conversation couldn't understand them and didn't know if their conversation had stopped for better or worse. Jade would ask her father to use preservation magic and that it was worth preserving they were in complete agreement with each other. The prince said that he thought Zion was being too bold and it wasn't that he'd read the verses in secret, it was the fact that he'd been mentioned there too. But Jade was annoyed that he played her the most and it was his father that Letitia mentioned first. For Zion, it was part of the fact that his name was mentioned in the third part, but he asked for the poems back because if the mistress found out that they had read them, she would be very angry. However, the boys did not understand why she would be angry. The prince thought that they should be printed out and given to all members of their clan to read so that others could write letters of praise and reviews. After all, these poems could be printed in the newspaper. It would be a memory of childhood. But Cyan said that if they did that, the lady would grow up and remember it all her life, especially if others read the poems, the lady would be embarrassed. Jade agreed with him, saying that Cyan was right, and it was enough that only the family would know about this nice detail, and he was going to praise her later. However, that was also completely wrong, because if he praised her talents too early, the mistress would not be able to fully develop them. In the end, Cyan managed to dissuade them, but he realized that if they found more of her diary, they would probably want to publish a book. And for what it was not to say that today she read him a story. A few days later at dinner, Letitia said that she hated her father and brother and did not understand how they could read her poems. The prince pointed to Sion and said that it was all his fault, for he was the one who had snooped on her writings. But the girl did not believe that he could do such a thing. He asked his father to forgive him, blaming it on Cullen. But the girl thanked him for dinner, said she'd come to you, and left. Letitia immediately guessed that Cullen and Jade had snuck a peek at her assignment because they'd been talking about studying poetry and chocolate cakes. She felt guilty for leaving her assignment unattended, but she thought they should feel guilty for reading it without asking. But since they were serving chocolate cake for dinner tonight, she decided as soon as Cullen and Jade got out of that and that she needed to get back there. She was distracted, however, by a knock on the door of the room where Cullen stood and said he had something very important to tell her that she would like very much. The girl wondered what it was, and perhaps he wanted to suggest a trip to a picnic or the circus, and worried that Cullen would change his mind if she continued to be cranky. So she decided to open the door. The girl wondered what it was, and perhaps he wanted to suggest a trip to a picnic or the circus, and worried that Cullen would change his mind if she continued to be cranky. So she decided to open the door. As soon as Cullen said it was about her school, she came out of the door, and he said he was going to send her to a private school because he wanted to ask her opinion. The girl was surprised, for it was the middle of the semester and not yet time for admission. However, the prince believed that there is always a way to solve the problem. Although obtaining permission for admission took him a long time, but Letitia was very smart, quickly learned to read and write, and moreover capable and believed that at school she can learn a lot. 